today are two very special guests, uh, Keith Frankish and Philip Goff. Uh, thanks both of you for joining me today. Um, it's very nice to have you back. Uh, I've enjoyed talking with you both previously. Um, one assumes that people sort of know who you might be, uh, but just in case, could you guys say a little bit about who you are and what you do in case someone's tuning in for the first time? I guess go on, Keith, you, you go first. Oh, I go first. <laughs> Whoever does it. <laughs> Well, I just want to remind, I, I'm currently an honorary reader with the um, uh, University of Sheffield, though I live in Crete, in Greece, and uh, my one of my major research interests is in the nature of phenomenal consciousness, nature and existence of phenomenal consciousness, on which I hold some uh, views which I consider quite modest, but other people consider absolutely outrageous. Uh, you consider them modest, really? <laughs> uh, very modest. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yes. No. 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 I know. And no, I'm. 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 I'm very much a, a very cautious in my views about consciousness. No positing strange, mysterious stuff like that. Um, so yes. Um, and uh, defend a view. I call this view illusionism for reasons that will become apparent. Uh, and yes, um, that's basically who I am. So, Philip. My name's Philip Goff. I'm a philosopher at Durham University, where I am right now. Uh, I guess my specialist interest is in consciousness. I'm interested in how consciousness fits into our overall theory of reality. And I uh, defend panpsychism, which I think is a very modest view, but some people think is absolutely outrageous. <laughs> uh, and I guess, I, I mean, we might get into some details, but I guess I just defend this as um i think there are such deep problems with the more traditional options of physicalism on the one hand and dualism on the other and and it's sort of panpsychism i think sounds a bit crazy but it avoids the deep difficulties with these other options so that's why i go for that but uh more generally i'm interested in reality in general lots of different questions about reality value uh other things things that are hard to fit into our picture, our overall picture of the world. And get my excuses in now, my little daughter woke me up at five o'clock this morning. So if I, uh, <laughs> if I perform badly, it's not, it's not because I, it, I am actually brilliant in general, but uh, a little bit tired now. Um, just get excuses in. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> well, I guess I'm the only one here who's not modest in this sense uh, i guess i think i like my most attracted to the identity theory and i guess i still think it's a bit of a strange and outlandish view and not very uh yeah so i i'm i'm, I'm curious that you guys have what you mean when you say that these views are modest i'm not sure what uh you know i was I just copying someone... keith oh i see okay <laughs> so maybe i might ask keith then so what do you mean when you think that your views are modest well I think there's 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 a great deal about consciousness that everybody agrees on. Okay, so we can sort of pick out the kind of states we're talking about when someone's attending to something perceptually and they're able to tell you about it and you know give you information about it and you know look, I'm seeing this apple there and it's red and it's got these properties yeah so and so well they're having a conscious experience of, of the apple okay so we're all kind of happy about that and our lives are made up of these things and. We're all agreed on that. What's the question is what's going on in those cases? What's what's actually happening? And I think we're all uh, just everyone who thinks about consciousness at all is completely agreed about sort of um, about massive elements of the picture that there is all kinds of um, uh, uh, biological processes that are occurring, neural processes that are occurring. Um, the assemblies of well, first of all, the light is hitting my eye and it's being stimulating the cells in the retina, and then there's a signal going from there to the being routed by, from in various way stations to the visual cortex at the back of the brain, and then vast networks of, of neurons are uh, being uh, activities being triggered in vast networks of neurons, and all kinds of stuff is happening. And we have a sort of rough idea of what they're doing, they're extracting information of various kinds. Uh, <clears throat> about shape and color and distance and all this kind of thing and they're um uh and then higher level ones are uh 
categorizing what you're seeing as an apple, as an, op as an object, an apple, and so on. And then this information is then being made available to other systems that um, provoke all kinds of responses, maybe emotion responses, associations, memories, beliefs are being formed. And you're getting ready to act on the basis of that, driving you to react in various ways. And all, all of this stuff is, I mean, the, these are all what uh, David Chalmers has called the easy problem of consciousness, but of course they're not easy at all. They're, it's really all the neuroscience of consciousness and the psychology of consciousness. And we're all agreed, I think, pretty much, not on the details, of course, there's a lot of thrashing out to do the details, but we all agree that science is at work on this and it's, there's, a, there's a continuing project or um, a whole raft of projects explaining and articulating what's going on. And at some point, I suppose, we'll get pretty close to a final account of what's happening there at that level. And my view is modest in that I think that's that's it. Once we've got that account, we'll have pretty much finished. Now, uh, the, the accounts that I think of as not being modest say, no, 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 there's something else happening. There's something, there's some kind of mysterious, well, perhaps I shouldn't use the word mysterious. There's a sort of inner world of experience that is somehow in some way additional to all of that. Um, that maybe it's the product of that, but it's not the same thing as that. There's something extra happening. An interior world of feeling and what do you want to call it, qualia. The, the way that the apple feel, the way that seeing the apple feels to me privately, in a way that, and, and, and this this world of private experience can't be investigated by the standard methods of neuroscience. It's completely private to me. No one else can investigate it. No one else can even be sure it exists. Only me. Now, my view is modest in that I think that there isn't such an inner world, that it's a kind of illusion created by all the first, by the, well, by, by the processes of the first kind. And I say, so I think that's a modest view. It doesn't, it's, you know, it's an Occam's razor. Don't, if you could explain our sense that there is this inner world in terms of processes of the first kind without actually endorsing the idea that there is this strange, essentially private world, then I think that's the modest way to go. I mean, maybe we can't in the end, but let's try it at least. And see. So, so Philip, what do you think about, I mean, I have something I want to say, but I'm just curious about what you might think about this claim to modesty that he's making. I think that was a really nice articulation of the view. And I mean, I've probably got a lot more time for this, for, for Keith's view than uh, other people sort of on my side of the debate, as it were, you know, I think it's coherent. I think it's philosophically defensible. Um, I mean, one difference might just be a question of starting points. Um, you know, how, how do we start thinking about reality? How do we... Um, I, I think we just have to start with what seems most evident. And it seems to me that... Um, I mean, I completely agree with Descartes up to the, the second meditation, you know, a little bit later, it gets a bit dodgy. But the thought that uh, our immediate awareness of our, our, nothing is more evident than our immediate awareness of our conscious experience, our immediate awareness of, of uh, awareness, awareness of our pleasure and our pains and our visual and auditory experiences. Uh, these are better known than and what we know about the external world. In some sense, the external world is at one remove. So I'm more certain that I'm having an experience, a visual experience of this table than I am that this table actually exists. You know, it's quite easy to get in the mindset that maybe I'm in the matrix and being deceived by evil computers. And there isn't really a table out there. But I know I'm having an experience of the table, even if there's nothing outside of my mind that it corresponds to. So, so I think Descartes was completely right there. Um, and these are the, you know, the sort of philosophical intuitions of the, 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 the let, let me not ramble, you know, so I think Descartes was completely right there. So, so I guess my disagreement with, with Keith is that he see, his, he seems to be, uh, using, starting with his em empirical data about the world about the external world and using that to undermine the reality of conscious experience. I think in a sense that's appealing to what is less well known <laughs> to undermine what is better known. And so in that sense, there's, there's, there's some, 
something in some sense irrational about about this because I think the reality of consciousness is is better known than the re the uh, the reality of the empirical data that is Keith starting. I mean, I start with the empirical data as well. You know, I absolutely, you know, the the empirical data must be taken seriously and and must be accounted for. But I think there's another source of data that's even better known, which is just our immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. And we've got to take both of these seriously in our theory of reality. So Keith talks about Occam's razor. Occam's razor is don't alter, multiply beyond necessity. Right. Uh, in my view, it's necessary to account for both the empirical data and the reality of our experiences that we're immediately aware of. And I think actually as a, as a scientific community, we still haven't quite come to grips with that. I mean, I think few people go so far as Keith in denying the reality of consciousness or phenomenal consciousness, if you want to put it that way. Um, but I think when people try to explicitly think what's the aim of science, they think it's to account for the data of observation experiment. If, you, if you've got a great theory that can account for all the data of observation experiment, and then that's job done. Whereas I think, no, there's this other thing. <laughs> You know, if, you, if you've got a theory that can account for all the data observation experiment, but can't account for the reality of pain, then uh, your theory is wrong. And so Keith is wonderfully consistent on this. I think most people are sort of a little bit confused because, yeah, of course, consciousness exists, but they don't explicitly accept it as an empirical data, uh, sorry, as a scientific datum in its own right over and above the data of observation and experiments. So that's the difference that, that Keith starts with just the empirical data, the data of observation experiment. I think there's another source of data, the reality of consciousness. But just one quick final point, given that these are just basic starting points, it's it sort of gets difficult to argue for because um, it's sort of every argument needs some premises. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. foundational. So. I mean, this is an old debate, too. I mean, probably at least going back to the exchange between Chalmers and Dennett, <clears throat> facing forward and facing backwards, the problem of consciousness, where, you know, there's one side claiming that you're leaving out the most fundamental data to explain, the other side saying you're importing stuff that shouldn't be imported there. Um, how, I mean, before moving forward, like, it's, given how foundational this disagreement is, is there any hope of moving forward in these debates, do you guys think? I mean, how do we argumentatively move forward when we're dealing with something there's nothing underneath? Well, uh, I, Philip, I mean, go. No, no, you go. Uh, I, I think Philip articulated that quite well. It is a difference of starting point. Um, I, I'm not sure. I think in a way we all start in the same place. We start with how the world seems to us. Um, and then you know, we do various kinds of experiments and manipulations in the world and we form theories and we try and maybe correct our in, in, initial in, uh, intuitions about the world. I mean, how the world seems to us is, is I think, I, I think pretty much everybody agrees that how the world seems to us is a sort of illusion. I mean, it seems that there are sort of, you know, colours painted on the world around us, that we live in what David Chalmers calls e Eden, a world where all these these colors act are actually intrinsic features of the surfaces around us. And uh, I think, and that's the same for other sensory qualities. And you know, science kind of says, well, it's not really like that. I mean, atoms and so on are not really colored and there isn't any sense in which they're colored. What, the, what there are out there are surfaces with various kinds of reflectance properties and so on. And the colors- I mean, that's, are, that's a weak kind of illusionism though, right? I mean, no, it's well, not- a... Well, no, that's, that's, I'm not, talking about that position, what I'm just saying is everybody accepts that here science has kind of corrected our initial impression. Right. That I mean, this is the very idea that there's a problem of consciousness comes precisely because con uh, because science has corrected our original starting point, which was kind of, look, you know, the colors are out there, out there painted on the world. Science comes along and says, well, they're not really actually. Now, then we say, but they're still real, right? So, well, then they must be kind of in our minds or something, okay? Um, and so already this idea that we're acquainted with an inner world of qualia, of kind of color surrogates as it were in our minds is already a correction of our original starting point. 
So what I, what I, I don't think there is a, a sort of pre-theoretical stuff. The, the starting point is just what we're inclined to say as, in, uh, you know, as completely untutored people. And I guess that there is, you know, I don't know, we'd have to do some sort of survey of people and see what they're, of, of very untutored people, but nobody's completely untutored. Uh, and so what we have uh, are these, you know, this bunch of intuitions. And then we try and systematize them and kind of try and sort of you know, make some sense of them. And we do manipulations of the world and try and produce a theory that shows how things hang together. And so I don't, and what this kind of tells us, one thing this tells us is that we are kind of just parts of the natural world ourselves. It seems we're not immaterial souls that have some kind of special access to reality. We are just biological machines. And so this inner, if there is an inner world of some sort that we're acquainted with, it too is part of the natural world. And our acquaintance with it is going to be mediated by some kind of mechanism, just as our acquaintance with the properties of things around us is going to be mediated by some sort of mechanism. And until we understand that mechanism, I think it's presumptuous to say, well, we just trust its deliverances. You know, whatever it tells us about this inner world must be absolutely correct and infallible, and that's a starting point. Uh, no, if we're parts of the natural world, it's a product of some kind of mechanism, and it could be misleading. I, I think illusion is just taking seriously the idea that, you know, we're not anything special when it comes to subjects, you know, experiencing subjects. I definitely think, you know, we're not anything special. I'm a part of the natural world and so on. Um, but just is it going back to the start of what you're saying? Is it is it really true that we're all we used, we start with seemings? Is that really true? I mean, if you think about, you know, your knowledge of your partner and your friends, do you start with the seems, you know, there seems to be somebody talking to me. What's the best explanation of that? Uh, is it, as a scientist, do you say, you know, there seems to be, ex, you know, experimental data? What's the best thing? You know, I, I think we start from there is somebody talking to me here. There is there is a table in front of me. Um, I like uh, Plantinga's phrase, um, Alvin Plantinga's phrase, properly basic uh, for the things that we take as basic and it's okay to take them as basic. We think it's rationally permissible to take it as basic. I mean, he sets this up in the context of wanting to prove that uh, God is properly basic, but you know right. that's very controversial. But I, I like that kind of framework of thinking, what is the things that are properly basic? I don't think anyone, either in, you know, in science or in relationships with others or, or common sense knowledge, what starts with seemings and yeah, tries to... Right. In the themings, you start with you know trusting your senses, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. trusting your sense that there's other people. Uh, now, not infallibly. That doesn't mean to say it's properly basic. Doesn't mean to say it's infallible, mm -hmm. but it's an it's a rationally acceptable starting point. So, among my rationally acceptable, in my view, starting points are trust. I can tr trust my senses. Uh, I can trust introspection. My apparent awareness of um of my my experiences so i don't start with the seeming i start with um the reality which is not to say it's infallible but it, mm -hmm. it's it's it, it, it's it's a starting point to accept what seem accept the seeming to put it that way it's not starting with oh here's a seeming it's mm -hmm. trusting the seeming just yeah. as we do with our senses, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, by things, I didn't mean anything very, very um, complicated. I just meant our intuitive judgments um, uh, about how things are. And yes, I mean, they're our starting point. Yes, sure, we start with intuitive judgments, but we don't stop with them necessarily. That's the point. Yeah, they're fine places to start. You don't get anyone else who starts with it, but that doesn't mean you can't go back and revise them. I don't think, I don't think there is, I, I'm not a foundationalist. I don't think there are certain facts that are, mm that form uh, the uh, the basis of all knowledge on that uh, I think everything is to some extent all our judgments are to some extent theoretically informed uh, yeah but you have to you have to rank them to a certain sense that you have to rank your initial starting points and what I'm saying is I mean I suppose I I, I, I think I have two disagreements with Keith one of which we haven't got on to yet but broadly speaking what we're talking about now is I would say I rank the, the apparent awareness of consciousness as 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 more certain a more certain starting point than the apparent awareness of an external world like Descartes did but so so that's that's one thing yeah but also I'm gonna do I don't think there is any yeah yeah sorry I, but, how do you the same point, yeah, go on. 
just say, how do you rank the claim that the redness that I perceive is a feature of the apple itself? How do you rank, redness, I, would, I, I would say that if you are ranking these claims, uh, the redness that the, the redness that I'm aware, the quality of redness that I'm experiencing, as it were, I would yeah. rank the claim that is a property of the apple itself, of the surface of the apple, as pre-theoretically, intuitively, I would rank that as much more basic than the claim that it's a property of my mental, my mind. I think, like the British empiricists did, that um, yes, upon when you when you haven't done any philosophy and you're just going about your daily life. You know, yes, it seems completely obvious that the redness is on the surface of the apple. But as the as Hume and the British empiricist said, you know, you just reflect. You, you once you reflect carefully, do a little bit of philosophy, it becomes apparent that it's 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 quite easy to doubt that um, the, the redness is really a property of of, of the thing out there. Um, indeed, there might not even be a thing out there. That's you 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 find that, that that's not not as certain as you initially took it to be and you discover that but the 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 apparent awareness of of a red quality in your experience is much more certain so i think after one does a little bit of philosophy uh it becomes your uh your apparent awareness of your own experiences and the qualities involved there is much more certain than your apparent th th than than your initial pre theoretical sense that there are qualities out there. Before the Aristotle, if he only had done some philosophy, he wouldn't. Have once you've done a bit of philosophy, <laughs> really. things very compelling. But I think you've already you've already taken the the um, the fatal step, as it were. And yes, once you there is a certain way of, of <laughs> there's a certain sort of theoretical lens you can use to look at your own um, uh, to apply to your own. Um, perceptual abilities and introspective abilities, which makes that sort of picture incredibly compelling, the sort of picture you're describing. And I think that in itself is fascinating, is interesting, and really, you know, cries out for explanation. This is what David Chalmers calls the meta problem, I call it the illusion problem. Um, and that is a very interesting fact about us. Now, it's, uh, everyone agrees that that needs explaining, okay? And um, uh, interestingly, David thinks it can probably be explained in terms of all those first kind of information processing processes even though that impression is true and there is this this kind of um uh in, in um uh, this, this this inner world he thinks our intuitions about it can probably be explained in information processing to some but the point is i think you have to take a few theoretical steps to get yourself in the frame of mind where that seems incredibly compelling um surely our initial start if we're talking about basic starting points the basic starting point is that you know the world that we live in Eden as, as, as it. well and it's yes yeah, so this is David Chalmers sorry I, I, I don't mean to put it but I just said that there are other ways of going people who know a lot more about Buddhist philosophy than I do tell me there are other ways of going here where you don't go into this kind of Cartesian and the Cartesian one the, 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 then it calls it Cartesian gravity is incredibly strong it sucks you in but people tell me you know more about that there are other ways of going and uh, yeah. At a fairly intuitive level. So, so can I just keep? Yes. Can I just ask you how you respond to the? I mean, maybe this is your response. That I'm thinking about, but so when Philip's talking about the Cartesian move, the the method of doubt, right? At, before you get to the second meditation, right at the end when you're swimming, and you know this could be a, this could be the matrix, this table, these colors, these experiences. Do you? Do you think that's already making the mistake right there? Is that where the problem originates? Because I, I think that's that's this kind of starting point where I'm uh, on board with Philip. I'm going to say, yeah, that seems to me like pretty foundational right there. How you characterize it is where the theory comes in. But right there, that this, the experience I, I, I'm having is uh, given to me in a certain way, regardless of what's out there in the world, that seems... I wonder what how, what your response to that claim is. What you have is a bunch of representations, okay? A representation of the world and of your perhaps of your inner, inner world. Now, yeah, but now you're you, you're giving theory now, Keith. Now yeah, you know no, you're absolutely. accusing me I, I, of smuggling I, I, in Cartesian theory, right? No, no, I, but I, I'm, I, I'm not claiming this is basic. I'm claiming this is this is the picture that hangs together best with everything we know about stuff with our intuitions and with our. I'm, I'm this is but how I. Thought, I see, but I thought basically. we were asking about starting points. I thought we were asking about starting. Uh, okay. I was talking to you about starting points, but I'm asking 
I would try to, I think Richard's question was slightly different, is how I understand what's going on in the Cartesian case, what, what, how I, what my own take is on what Descartes is doing, which is explicitly theoretical, I think, because he's engaged in doubt and these kind of things. Which, no, I, don't, I, th I, th I, think, I think Richard was asking you, is there a legitimate certain starting point here? That's what he was asking you. Okay, and and your answer to that was, your okay, answer to that was something very, very theoretical. It, did, it didn't seem a good account of a, of a starting point. So either you reject okay. that there is a, a certain starting point, or you tell us a starting point that's, that okay. you claim so is, is not close to theory. Is the one that, that, I, that I mentioned before, which is all the judgments we're inclined to make about the world, about the world being coloured and out there. So I think, that, so I think that's to reject Descartes. That's to reject Descartes. So that's oh, to disagree with Richard. No, that's right. Us. Descartes doesn't. Descartes doesn't say, you know, I'm certain of the judgments I make. Descartes says I exist as a conscious subject, as you know, as a conscious mind. Uh, and Richard's asking you, do you think he was wrong to think there's something of certainty here? Right. He didn't say. He didn't say. I, I you know, I, I think. Therefore, I, I, I know what judgments I make. I, I, I thought. Richard's question was about the, the general scepticism about the external world rather than about scepticism about the self, which is a sort of rather different. Yeah, I was asking about whether you think there's a legitimate place to start here. Uh, yeah. And the scepticism about the external world, I don't even know if that's really what Descartes cares about. Right. I mean, there's a lot of textual evidence that maybe he's not even really motivated by skepticism, but mm -hmm. but 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 the, the, the Phillips point I thought was that here's a place to start. Um, right. where we have some uh, intuitive judgments mm -hmm. about what is certain. And mm -hmm. one of those is that we're experiencing things and uh, so forth and so on. And you take, now you don't have to read in, I know, you know, you don't, you don't want to overly theoretically characterize that starting point, but isn't that still a starting point? And I thought well, at the beginning you were saying, yeah, we start with, you know, our intuitive judgments and, and this is one of them, isn't it? That's uh but we start with we start the judge of judgments that there's that there's this this world out there. I'm this uh, subject of some kind that's experiencing this world, and so on. And then we can reflect on these judgments, and we can ask ourselves what uh, grounds we have for them, and we can start to entertain skeptical hypotheses about most of them. Some of them we can't perhaps uh, uh, manage to doubt. That doesn't show they're not they're they're they're, they're, they're true. What it seems to me that happens is there's a kind of move that Descartes then makes from, I can doubt the red apple. I can doubt that my judgments about the red apple are true. But there's something here that is indub indubitable. And that's my experience of the apple. Okay, so we turn a skeptical claim into a sort of foundational uh, uh, knowledge claim. I can be doubt, I can, I can be, I'm, I, I can, I'm, I can't be certain about the internal, the, the external world, so I must be certain about something internal. I think that's where you, where the mistake goes. I don't think it's an argument. That makes it sound like an inference, and, and Descartes explicitly says there isn't an inference here. It's not saying, it's not saying, be, it's not because I can doubt the external world, there must be something else. Descartes saying, is there anything I can't doubt? Uh, let's find out. It's a practical exercise. Well, he claims when you no, you can say no, you can say no, you disagree. But he claims when you go through this, you find out that you can doubt that there's an external world, but you can't doubt that you exist as a conscious mind. Um, I, I mean, I'm actually prepared to be a bit more modest. As I said earlier, just say what you find at the end of this exercise is that um, the the the. Your existence as a conscious subject is much better known than the existence of external world. So, so that you know, I'm not saying anything's infallible, but um, but that's the Cartesian, you know, but that, that's the starting. It's not the you, you, your starting. It seems to be where we start off with these intuitive judgments, uh, and what we're explaining, trying to explain the intuitive judgments. I think you know the Cartesian claim for what it's worth, and you might just say. I don't buy it. I haven't given any arguments for this. I'm just, the claim is that there's something we know better than anything else. And, you know, is that our existence is a conscious mind. It's not, a, it's not the starting point. Sorry, I'm, I might be repeating myself, but just to make it clear, the starting point is not, I intuitively judge that I exist as a conscious mind. The starting point is I exist as a conscious mind. The, 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 yeah. 
the issue is about the, the self. And I mean, the fact that I'm making the judgments implies some sort of judge, uh, you know, I mean, what exactly what, what, what we mean by the subject here, I mean, and how thick it is and the other side, this, this takes us into a lot of complicated issues. So I know it might seem easy, but let's just bracket that from, let's just talk about the idea of the world of experience. And it seems to me that what the, the sort of the Cartesian process, and we're, we're set aside whether this is actually Descartes, but the sort of Cartesian process is that you can begin to doubt the external world, think that maybe it's a sort of matrix kind of world or something, but you can't doubt but then what you do is what you is the starting point is I can't doubt that I'm here in this world outside. It's just obvious it's there and I'm experiencing it. And that's the that's the pre-theoretical position. You realize the reasons for doubting those, not trusting those judgments completely. And then you sort of but then you say, well, but there's something that I'm acquainted with here. There's something that I'm in direct contact with here. If it's not an ex external world, it must be an internal world. There must be some internal kind of um, analog of it or something that's and that's what i'm really acquainted with mm -hmm. and the intuition is that you're really acquainted with something that has all these properties that is blue and you know the, the, the sky i can see blue sky uh, and has all these colors and these quality parts. i'm acquainted with those things if they're not features of the external world or i can doubt it, then i they must be features of an internal world. and it's that notion of acquaintance that then internalizes all of this stuff now i think that move is a theoretical move. I think it's a. I think it's a incredibly um, uh, persuasive move for reasons that are fascinating, psychologically fascinating. But I think it's one that can be resisted. And but I Keith, resist what what you've just done there is is I don't think you've characterised how the Cartesian understands herself. You've <laughs> characterised a diagnosis of what you think is going wrong. So yeah. you, the Cartesian doesn't say this is doubtable, therefore there must be something that's not doubtable, therefore they say, oh no, when I go through this process, I see that there's something that's not no, no, doubtable. So you, 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 you're diagnosed, oh, okay, so we're in agreement on that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's how the Cartesian sees it. Okay. I think the Cartesian's wrong. I think they're seeing it the wrong way. So what are your starting points then? You, so you, you <laughs> reject, so, uh, uh, so what are your starting points? So, so you reject that there is, so, so you reject the Cartesian starting point, which I think was Richard's question. What, what are you, so what are your, what are the starting points? What are your starting points to um, find out about reality? How, how I'm inclined to judge things are that I'm living in this, you know, three dimensional world with all these, you know, painted all over with qualitative properties and so on. Um, but, and that I'm kind of here, physical being, well, I don't know, maybe I have intuitions about my non-physicality, I don't know, but we can go into other, I have all these judgments about how things are, most of them are just, you know, just the same as anybody else's, and then we start doing science, we start, we start realizing that maybe I think that, uh, maybe I have intuitions about my non-physicality, because, you know, I could, I can dream or whatever, or whatever, and all these reasons people maybe have for being dualists. And then we do some science and we think about this and we realize how my abilities and my judgments and so on are dependent on the stuff that's happening in my brain. And we start to think maybe physicalism looks more true. And so we just try and, we, we, the idea is to try and do what, you know, Wilfred Sellers said the aim of philosophy was, you know, which is to see how things in the broadest sense of the term hang together in the broadest sense of the term. And when we do that, I think we're led away. We, we realize that that Cartesian picture compelling as it is, is is a dead end because it takes oh, us out of the world. Maybe I've misunderstood your view then, Keith. So I thought you thought the Cartesian, let's call my way of thinking about consciousness, that you know, the Cartesian way for a sake of discussion, I'm sure that can mean all sorts of different things. It doesn't mean dualism, to be clear, but you know, well, that we're, but uh, it doesn't obviously mean dualism. Uh, um, but I thought you thought that was pretty natural and you know, know. A, a natural normal belief but uh, but that there's sort of some reason to doubt but but now it seems like you're saying it's it arises from philosophical confusion i think it's a very natural bit of folk philosophy i think it's i think there are i don't oh. think it's sort of hardwired into us i don't think it's kind of innate but i think there are features of introspection features of our access to our own perceptual abilities that make that picture incredibly compelling and that you only need to do a little bit of, of, of sort of, you know, not the sort of philosophy that involves classes, you know, you just need to be like a sort of reflective six year old. And you very quickly. Yeah. Can I say, can I say two things? I mean, th th okay, so now I 
think you're less of an illusionist than I thought you were. Because I think the I think the illusionist. I think of oh, Richard's disappeared. Oh, he's appeared. I think of the illusionist as someone who says, you know, this is not philosophical confusion. This is our normal way of thinking about things. That there's pain and that you know, of it, but uh, that's just wrong. Whereas I, I think that the, the people who think like. Um, uh, is it Baker or Hacker who has that paper? Is there anything that's like to see about who, who, or Snowden's got a paper? Like, you know, who think there's some philosophical confusion here? I don't think that is illusionism. That's like philosophical. But but the second thing I want to so that's interesting. I've learned more about your position, maybe. Uh, but anyway, sure but the second thing I wanted to say. Just, just, just one more thing. Uh, yeah. Oh, so just 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 I I, I so yeah, th those philosophical intuitions of the 16 year old, you know, who starts thinking about philosophy and thinks, um, you know, what I see is red might be what you see is green. Or I really trust those intuitions. They're so universal. And I think in the 20th century, there arose a sort of suspicion of those two intuitions, like, oh, they're just schoolboy philosophy. And we go, we go up to Oxford and Cambridge and we overcome those. I'm not talking about you, Keith. I'm talking about 20th century Ryle. You know, they're just, we grow out of them. But I think that was sort of a kind of intellectual snobbery, and I think I, that's what I base my philosophy on. The, you know, the the, the thoughtful sixteen-year-old, these natural philosophical intuitions that uh, that you know I I think are are basically sound. Yeah. Let me say something. Sorry. I mean, I, I I I really like the way you articulate that because I think that's it's a very that's a clear statement of position. And I think if you do trust those intuitions, then I think the position you end up with is really quite plausible um which is <laughs> one reason why I'm, I'm suspicious of them because i think you are led down this kind of path and i think you are forced to make the kind of wisdom that which you do with great you know rigor and carefulness and you know you you i mean i, I if you're going to trust those intuitions then yeah I, I, if i trusted them i i think i'd be along a similar path to you um and in a way i'm not even saying that i'm not like certain we shouldn't trust them, but I, was, I think I don't think we have to trust them. I don't. I think there's another way of doing it. And I, I just like to plug that you can trust them and still be not a panpsychist. I mean, I'm uh, not sure what the, the yeah, trusting like, of the intuition doesn't seem to me to lead you anywhere. It's a place to begin theorizing, and then different commitments will push you in different ways. But I don't. I don't. I think if if the reason why you don't want to trust the intuitions is because you're afraid of where they're leading, then that's kind of not the best now, way to, to theory build. It can gang up on you because I this, <laughs> one of the my my one of my my targets. I mean, partly my I reject this sort of view, but I'm broad categorizing as Cartesian. You know, but I also think that the my other target is the the physicalists who think we can trust those intuitions and honor those intuitions on the cheap, as it were. Without doing, you know, without paying the metaphysical price for it. Well, we did pay really the metaphysical nice, price for actually, it. The, the, <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty high price to say that my experience of red is just some activity in V4. That's a huge price. Are you kidding? It sounds kind of, uh, you'll see, I mean, you'll see most, most people find it like just wildly implausible. So that's a huge metaphysical price. That's the identity theory. I don't see that they're getting away with anything cheap here. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to even make that intelligible, how, how something like that could be physical. Just so I don't really see that I'm trying to get off on the cheap. I'm just trying to say, look, I'm not going to give up on consciousness, but I also think there's good reasons for physicalism. So, uh, you know, don't import too much theory. And I think that's actually what you do. You know, Eric Switch, Switch Gable had this nice blog post about you, Keith, where he, he accused you of having a strategy of inflate and explode where you take a concept that you don't like and you pump it up with all this extra crap that no one wants and then you say look no one wants that boop it goes away but that's that's theoretically loading the game and all we're saying is there's a starting point which is relatively um theory neutral and maybe it needs to be refined but it's not gonna i mean worrying about where it goes is sort of uh, a, a problem i guess i'd say okay. I, I don't. I, I mean, I've, I've been to this with, with with Eric a couple of times, a few times, and I think I think there is a the, a, a a theoretically neutral one uh, starting point. It's very simple. It's like, okay, it's whatever it is that is happening now, as I attend to this apple in front of me, you know, it, it, whatever's happening in relation to my being aware of the apple. That's a theoretically neutral point, but that gener that that doesn't that 
if that was our starting point, we, we wouldn't have any of these intuitions about it, this being something problematic to explain something that could be inverted. There, we, we, there wouldn't even be a problem. Well, what is it? I don't ask. Guys, I, I hate to interrupt, but uh, we just got a, a comment here that says, only philosophers could spend half an hour trying to agree on where to start. <laughs> that's what it's things. all about. Steve, yeah, that's about, uh, that's about right. We are going to get on the pentagism at some point. But, but I, I, just, point I just think we've got a, we, it's a really nice setup, actually. There's really nice, interesting disagreement and agreement. So I think me and Richard agree on the Cartesian starting point. Right. Uh, me and Keith agree that if you start with the Cartesian starting point, you d you go away from materialism. And Keith and Richard agree on materialism, but so there's there's yeah. a nice sort of symmetry, is that the word? Or that's the, Yeah, we've got all the positions here. So you just have to watch this video and decide who's right. And you don't ever have to think about philosophy of mind or consciousness. You should have a little waiting uh, bars at the side, and then we could decide, you know, we could... <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah. we did get a question for Philip here, I guess, if I, are you, do you guys want me to put up these questions now, or should we wait until the end, maybe to do that, I'm not sure. No, I don't uh, This is a little bit I off topic, mind. but it is an interesting question from Andrew, it says, uh, how do you respond, I think you did respond to uh, Sabine, right, but they want to know how you respond to her criticism that we would have found these extra properties by now. I guess I would say that's just a red herring, it's not even relevant, but what would you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did have a little brief blog post on this, so the the kind of so I think that's completely spot on if you're talking about a kind of dualistic panpsychism. When people initially hear about panpsychism, you tend to think the electron has its physical properties like mass, spin, and charge, and it has these other consciousness properties. So it's like a kind of dualism, and that would lead to exactly the problems Sabine is pointing to that you know these extra properties don't seem to be in physics. Um, but I think that the, the panpsychism I would defend, at least, is radically non-dualistic. The idea is that physical properties like mass, spin, and charge are forms of consciousness. So there's not two kinds of properties. There's just there's just the properties physics talks about. And how does that how that seems like to make no sense at first? But it's this Russell Eddington line that actually physics doesn't tell us what mass, spin, and charge are. It just characterizes them in terms of behavior, what they do. It doesn't tell us what mass is, it tells us what it does, the behavior it endows to particles. Um, and then the panpsychic proposal is, is that mass is um, a form of consciousness. So, so that's how you get around that problem. Uh, so it's a way of, you know, so it's a way of bringing together these two problems. This is the essential, you know, the, the problem sometimes called the problem of intrinsic natures, the, Physical science just tells us what stuff does. It doesn't tell us what it is. The problem of consciousness, how the hell does consciousness fit in? You bring them together and solve them both at once by saying consciousness is the intrinsic nature of matter. But it's not, not some extra stuff. There's just the stuff physics talks about, but physics doesn't tell us what it is. That's the view. And so, I mean, do we all the, agree? That that we, all we, agree we, don't expect, uh, that we don't expect physics to discover these properties. They can't be discovered by physics. Physics discovers what they do, but not what they are. That's, that's kind of lying. Yeah, mind. consciousness is unobservable, at least. Is it? You know, you can't look inside someone's head and see that. You know, you can't look inside it. People say, why you can't test panpsychism? And I say, yeah, you can't test any theory of consciousness. You can't look inside a particle and see it, well, check whether it's got feelings. But you can't, just as you can't look inside someone's head and see their experiences. Uh, this is, uh, this is, I guess, why part of the reason Keith thinks it's a lot, load of nonsense. Uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, if you're in the game of being a realist about consciousness, then the, the, the one big problem is that it's not observable. But so this is a hypothesis. Uh, so any theory of consciousness is, in that sense, not testable. All we can do is correlate uh, what brain processes with conscious experiences. Uh, and then try and formulate the best hypothesis to explain those those correlations. And I think panpsychism is the most, you know, the, the best explanation of what's uh, of of how those correlations are obtain. Of why? Sorry, why those? You you. Uh, Keith, are you raising your? You, know, you've got to, uh, you, can't, you can't correlate uh, 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 things with consciousness. You can only correlate them with signs of consciousness. Precisely as you say, because you have no access to 
another person's consciousness. And in fact, I would even say in our own case, all we can do is correlate uh, the conditions with our own judgments of consciousness. I, I, see, I, I, dis I dispute that, Keith, but for the reasons we've been talking about, because I think, again, coming back to planting as phrase, what are the start? What do you take as properly basic? I take as properly basic, you know, if I'm having a conversation with my wife, I take it as properly basic. She's telling me she's happy or whatever. I don't take it as properly basic. She seems to, there's a seeming of her and what, you know, it's properly basic. She's talking to me. It's properly basic. I'm having an experience. So I, I think when you talk to someone and you take their word for it about their consciousness, you're not starting with their words and inferring by a principle of the best explanation, and sorry, inference best explanation to their consciousness. You, you're taking their consciousness as properly basic. So I think in that sense, you can correlate experiences with, you can't see them, but I, I don't think that's the only form of basic judgment. So you don't think there's any possibility of any, I mean, but there are all kinds of cognitive machinery involved in producing those reports, the words that come out of your, of your mm -hmm. partner's mouth. Yeah. And we can certainly imagine neurological conditions in which they, you know, you know, your wife's being perfectly sincere in what she's saying and trying to make, but something's gone sort of haywire with the machinery and yeah. the reports are not yeah, published. That for you isn't a possibility or it's a possibility you just ignore or? No, of course. Why should the skeptical yeah. situations? I mean, that the possibility of a skeptical scenario doesn't like intrude on my everyday. Should I step in front of this bus or not? I don't know. This could be an illusion. I mean, I don't. Uh, I feel like we don't need to worry about skeptical those kind of skeptical claims because they're they're yeah. relevant or in, in a normal interaction with your people. I'm sure. not worried about whether you're an automaton or not. I think you're a person. What the data are for a science of consciousness, and if if the reports then we need to be sure that the reports are really, that what we're you know, sure we can correlate the reports of consciousness with neurological uh, 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 conditions and so on, and it's got kinds of different kinds of stimuli and so on. We can do that, there's no problem with that. The question is whether we are there correlating them with consciousness itself. And unless you think that I mean, the, the relation between, con on, on a realism between consciousness and the reports has got to be mediated by some kind of processes. And it seems if we don't have some theory of those, I don't see how we can re just take the reports as as, 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 a, as a transparent window on the experiences. And if we can't, then they're not the right data for no. science and consciousness. Even in our own case, how do you know that your judgments about consciousness are correlating with your actual consciousness? The things that you say. Of course the machinery's, of course the machinery's there, but the starting point is uh, someone's talking to me, someone with their own mind is talking to me, and and then we have a theory for what's going on. And of course, you, you know, you're not talking by telepathy. You postulate a theory to explain those basic starting points. But Keith, what, what are, you, are you telling me that when you talk to a close friend, your judgment that they have a mind is an inference to the best explanation from their behavior? It all depends what, what do you think I mean by mind. If, 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 if mind is something sort of Just, essentially private, essentially private and... Uh, no, 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 no. Just in, in, in some sense you would agree with, you know, in some sense you would agree with that they that they are, you know... That there is an, an intelligence here, an intelligent I'm, person. Is that an inference to the best explanation? I'm, I'm, I'm from you know, I'm, I'm a Riley and I'm a lot of things. So no. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Maybe that, maybe, maybe I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm that completely point. with you on that. It's just, I mean, and if you want to go, if you want to go hetero phenomenological about consciousness and, you know, just be an interpretivist about that, then I'm happy with that. Yeah. If somebody you, says I'm in pain, then I'm just going to accept it and say, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's pretty much all there is to be in pain is reacting in all this bunch of ways as far as i'm concerned i mean so, yeah, I, I'm transparent I on thought, that. it's if there's okay. some fact that's underlying this that I'm, this, this mysterious. fair enough I, I take that challenge back but you seem to i thought we agreed there are different starting points and you seem to be going back on that now you seem to keep saying no there are really only your starting points and that's oh, that's betrayed by the fact that you say no we can't correlate uh with consciousness we can only correlate with with um, people's behavior or reports or something, but that's just denying my starting points. I take it to be properly basic that um, that, that, that's, that's another conscious mind is talking to me. I think that's a, a properly basic starting point. So you, so you, sorry. I just I, I think we have difference in what we mean by starting point. I mean, for me, a starting point is just where you start, but you, you can go back. Epistemologically. 
No, I don't, not, not, not in a foundationist way. I mean, the starting point is, you know, where you start, but then you can go back and retrace your steps and, you know, cancel that out and take a different route. And I know it's, it's, I don't think, I, it's not a cumulative process. It's a process of just seeing how things hang together and where you start and may not, you may not end up at a place that's consistent with where you, <laughs> that doesn't really make sense, but, you know, you can undo your starting point, as it were, you know, you know. Um, uh, I agree with that. Holistic well, so then why don't, if that's the case, why don't you start with us and then argue that you undo it? So well, I'm not sure why you, why I don't want to say, look, we start with the reality of consciousness, but then we're theoretically forced to revise and so forth and so on, instead of denying the starting point altogether. Well, I mean, if you, if you have a bunch of intuitions about, uh, you know, a bunch of intuitions about the reality of consciousness and about, if you have an intuition. It's not intuitions. <laughs> we're not starting with intuitions. We're starting with, with, I am a conscious mind. You'll start with intuitions that you trust <laughs> and that you call, you know, uh, properly basic, but they are still intuitions. No, we're starting in the Morian position. Here's a hand. <laughs> I mean, no, it's, well, uh, it's a bit more uh, like that. There, it's there. We're we'll starting from there. You're, start, you're assuming something like a relation of acquaintance in all of this, that there are certain things that, you know, that you, whatever you in this context is, is, uh, is uh, 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 are directly aware of in a way that doesn't involve any kind of mechanism that isn't naturalistic no one's assuming that though just that consciousness is real doesn't see this is the inflate and explode strategy it's like you want to import all of these theoretical claims and say well those are un, untenable and yeah they are i don't i don't think i would defend that view but that's not just saying that consciousness is real doesn't require you to say i'm directly acquainted with it i didn't deny i'm directly acquainted with consciousness in any any philosophical sense like russell meant i mean uh, I mean, I think I can tell a story about about that, but uh, it doesn't. I don't think that's part of the basic well, think, data. That's a theory. Like the, I think if your starting point is one that that cannot lead you to illusionism, then you've obviously imported some theoretical claims into it. But it um, could lead you to illusionism. That was kind of my point: is that you could start say consciousness is real, and then do a bunch of theory, and then revise and say, oh well, gee, this must. My feeling that it's real must be an illusion. So that seems yeah. to be more, a more like honest toil as opposed to theft way of getting to illusionism instead of denying the starting point. You're misrepresenting what my, my starting points. I'm, I'm quite happy if you want to start there. I'm not, I don't, you know, I, I think the way we start is not with intuitions about, you know, there being an inner sort of Cartesian realm. I think there are intuitions about the world just being and every, all the qualitative properties that are supposed to populate this inner world being out there. I just, that's just a, that's just a bit of a claim about how I think people, what I think people's intuitions are. But if their intuitions are all thoroughly Cartesian, and that is our starting point in the sort of, you know, the de facto way that that's where people self find, then I'm just going to argue with them from there. Well, but uh, I mean, so that was, but that's my point though, because I agree when I was, when I was 16, I was like, the red light is red. What are you talking about red? So I was like, the, it, it was, but that was a confusion. And I was, in my opinion, and I was led away from that by thinking about how we mathematically characterize light and how red is it mathematically characterized and so forth and so on. So I revised my starting point. Mm. And that's the kind of point I'm trying to make to you is that why don't you start <laughs> with like the claim that consciousness is real and then argue that it's gotta be revised as opposed to saying this the starting there is, is wrong. I, 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 don't, I don't mind you. My starting point isn't anything that, uh, of the kind that Philip calls you know, properly basic. It's my starting point doesn't have any special epistemic status. It's just wherever you have to enter the, the debate from. So I don't really think that to me, that isn't how the world seems to me in, you know, sort of completely pre theoretically, if I can even remember how, but, but if that's where your way in is, then I'm okay. I'm not saying you shouldn't start from that point. I'm just saying you shouldn't stop at it. Um, maybe, uh, m maybe we, we've been ganging up on Keith for the whole discussion. Maybe Maybe we should give him the level. Maybe we should. Maybe me and Keith should should actually gang up on Richard, Richard, and then you and Richard should gang up on me. Does that sound like uh, a good plan? Good to me. Sure, gang, gang away. We do have a question for Keith. I guess uh, if you want to, before we stop ganging up on him um, from Dorian, it says Keith, how do quasi phenomenal properties appear or reference actual qualia without an acquaintance with them? For example, I can reference my keyboard due to having the right kind of acquaintance. I'm not uh, sure I understand the question. Uh, Quasi-phenomenal properties, uh, uh, that's a term I've used to mean whatever properties it is that our judgments about qualia are in fact sensitive to. So when I, if I say as a, you know, as a sort of Cartesian or whatever, that I'm acquainted with this 
read quietly. Now, I'm not, that's just, not just, a, and I say there, there isn't such a thing. The judgment isn't true. Um, but I didn't just sort of make it out of the blue just randomly without, you know, there was uh, some, uh, I, I make these judgments in a systematic way in certain circumstances and not in other circumstances and so on. So I'm, my judgments are tracking some real condition. Um, and I use the word quasi-phenomenal properties for whatever it is, whatever I assume physical properties, perhaps uh, properties of my, of my uh, neural processes, that my judgments are, cause, are in fact causally sensitive to. So that's what I mean by it. But I don't think we don't need acquaintance with qualia. Uh, to have those properties, or to misrepresent them, to misjudge them, to be actual qualia. Anyway, the quasi-phenomenal properties are the properties that are misrepresented as actual. I'm actually inclined to think of these as actually as properties of the external world, as powers in, in objects to affect right. us in a certain way. Um, I, I guess, though, the question, is, as I understood it, is asking how is it that you can misrepresent them without having some acquaintance yeah. with the thing? Yeah, that's that's uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, yeah that's, yes. How can I, if they don't exist, how can I represent things as as having those properties? Well, we can represent all sorts of things that don't exist. That's in itself the problem of representing non-existent things. Isn't uh, you know, represent Santa Claus and and, uh, and God and uh, whatever, assuming God doesn't exist. Um, and we can, I mean, Nick Humphrey has this nice example of the impossible triangle, this object, which if you look at it from a certain angle, it looks like, you know, it, it looks exactly like a, a, a object that is impossible in three dimensional space, but you still, rep, and you represent it as that impossible object. That's how your visual system represents it to you as an impossible object. Or think of an Escher um, illustration where things seem to be, or oh, that lovely, what's it called, the, the, the where the tone seems to be continually increasing, or an audio example. Yeah, that and infinitely increasing tone, right? Infinitely increasing. Now, it, your brain is representing these things as something they could not possibly be. How is it doing that? Well, now that's an interesting question. Uh, and I don't, have, I, mean, I, I don't have an answer, but I don't think there's any reason in principle to think that they couldn't be done, because we have so many examples where it is done. Can can I can I ask one more ganging up on Keith question? <laughs> I'm just trying to get clear because I I somehow think I somehow think sorry I'm getting a bit carried away I'm getting because I'm getting interested in this now I, I I'm not meaning to gang up I somehow think you're surreptitiously denying my starting points so let me try and nail you n nail the question nail you but say you know why why do you trust your intuition that there's an external world? more than your intuition, your Cartesian intuition. Or, or pretend you have the Cartesian intuition, right? Pretend you're me. Why should I trust my intuition that there's an external world more than my Cartesian intuitions? I don't. I just think that's, I mean, you, okay. we, we were talking about starting points. I don't trust any of my intuitions. I think everything is corrigible in the light of wider theoretical considerations. We were just, when, I, when we talk, this is why I say, when I talk about starting points, okay. I don't mean in your sense things that are, that are properly basic. I mean, just, you know, where you come in, you know, um, and I think- But there must be something with epistemic force. There must be, uh, that's a starting point in something, no? I, I don't think so. I, I'm not a foundationalist. Well, just let's talk about intuitions then. Let's, you know, what, you, you, suppose you start off and you're a Cartesian, you have these Cartesian intuitions, but you also have, let's call them beliefs. Mm, yeah, you know, <laughs> I have a belief that I have a belief that you know this Cartesian way, uh, uh, and I have a belief about the external world. It, it seems to me you're giving more weight to the external world beliefs than the Cartesian beliefs. Why? Uh, look, I have. Um, I, I suppose because. I'm, well, I'm not quite sure I want to agree with you on but let's say I am. Because I seem to be in, in, I seem, the picture I seem to develop is not that I'm kind of like this isolated figure sitting by my stove, you know, but I'm actually in this massively complicated world, which we have managed to explore and investigate at multiple different levels of organization. And we've understood how these different levels of organization hang together, you know, in that line, and how it all fits together with a, you know, a picture of the cosmos and we, you know, we, 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 we've got a really rich picture of this, and we seem to be kind of little bits in this, interesting little bits in this picture, in that we have a kind of in, a perspective on it all. 
And we're beginning to develop theories of how we have that perspective, representational theories of mind and this sort of thing. We're beginning to explain this. And it seems to me that that's kind of the way to go, is to see how we little, little, relatively insignificant, you know, cosmological uh, uh, things fit into this big picture. And it seems to me that the way is more likely that we are just complex organizations of the other stuff that we've been uh, we've begun to understand that are able in this yeah. very clever way to represent the rest of it to itself and create a sense for it be, of it being a, a subject. Now, uh, that seems to me just the more, more plausible picture than that I have some kind of, it seems an inflated um, anthropocentric and even a bit, let's say, arrogant idea that how things seem, that there are some things that seem to me that are just uh, incorrigible in that way and that I have this kind of special status in this world of having acquaintance with certain yeah. basic facts about it. It's almost um, like the Horrigan critique of uh, that Philip was responding to, the, that this is a pre-Galilean kind of right, right. returning us to a we're special. Um, yeah. I know you just wrote something about this, Keith. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to, I mean, so let's gang up on you. <laughs> Keith and I will What's get Philip. <laughs> okay, well, okay. How do you, what, do you, what do you say about this? You're dragging us back to a very anthropocentric, um, making the human experience special pre-Galilean worldview, which is a part of what I heard Keith was saying. Well, it's, well, as I wrote a blog post responding to John Horgan's article on this this morning, actually, just but um, yeah, I think it's quite the opposite. I think you know, if, if for non-panpsychists, human consciousness is something incredibly special so that, that has only existed on our planet perhaps and only in very recent history and you know consciousness i believe i take to be the the source of all that is of real value in human existence whereas um in 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 existence actually uh, whereas if you're a panpsychist you know human consciousness is just one highly evolved form of something that exists quite generally in the universe and um so I think of it as, as a kind of new Coper Copernican revolution that you stop putting human consciousness as the, the center of everything. It's, uh, well, yeah, we're I don't see what's that. Uh, we're on the same page because I think of it as something, you know, as a highly evolved organization of something that exists everywhere else in the universe. I, we're on the same page. It's not special. So what's, hey. so what's, what, where, what's your critique of me then, given that? What's uh, the thing that I think it's a highly evolved form of is just, you know, sort of regular, you know, non-conscious matter. Right, no, that's that's the disagreement, but yeah, yeah. but I mean, what well, we're but, on the I same. Mean, I'm, I'm asking you to. We don't think. There's tell some me sort of why I'm wrong. No, we're not. I'm just saying why we're on the same side that we don't think there's some point in the sort right. of evolution that's yeah. where the light comes on. You think the light was always on everywhere. I think that the, the, the light's just an illusion. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I think certain, the light comes on at a certain point, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so, ah, that's but yeah, so, well, so, the, so so that's the commonality. But for yeah, the but, sake of having an, for the sake of having an argument where, where do you think the the cartesian or the panpsychist goes wrong oh you must I think just, i go wrong somehow i mean yeah, there's something wrong with yeah it's the opaqueness of the phenomenal consciousness uh, uh, in, in, in the, the unwillingness to to uh, question a starting point but i think one thing you've written about i know in your, 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 your i am your willing book. i am willing to question i just gotta i've just gotta correct that i mean i am willing to question it I just don't see. I'm asking for a reason why I should question it. Well, you need to look at the the, at the alternative picture and see if. I and mean, you can't judge this just by looking at one sort of you know you know bullet proposition and you know I do accept that. You need to look at the, the nature of the whole pro, the whole picture that is being painted and how it hangs together with the pictures that everyone else is painting. Because and when I a, do that, when I do that, why will I see that there's a problem? What is well, the problem? I know, with like it, I will it's a matter of individual psychology, I suppose. Which one? You know, which, no, no, but. Okay. Okay. I think he's asking I'm trying to get an, an I'm trying to <laughs> get an argument going. <laughs> I'm asking you to tell me what's, what's wrong with my view. You're being too nice. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, we, I'm we, we kind of want Richard here because he does think there's a point at which the light comes. I'm pointing out that we have we agree that 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 in a way humans are not that special. I, because I don't think the light ever comes on you, think because you think the light was always on everywhere, that the atoms yeah, have a sure. chance. Of. I mean, Richard, to be fair, you, you, interestingly, you guys, I mean, I've spoken to you individually, and I've heard you each say, kind of in a shocking to me manner, that if you didn't have the view you had, you would take the other's view. So I know, Keith, you've said maybe you would go his way if you took those situations seriously. And I know Philip has said that if he rejected panpsychism, he'd become an illusionist, whereas I have like a death-first attitude towards both of these views. <laughs> 
So I think, I think that's David Chalmers that, said that as well, for what it's worth. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, I, that's first for illusionism for me. I want to do so. those memes with the, you know, the, the guy looking at the girl in the red dress, you know, <laughs> and it's Philip or Dave, you know, and it's probably dualism. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I, I mean, so what the argument that I would, I mean, for, for, to fill up is I would challenge the trans, transparency of phenomenal concepts. I mean, that's what the whole, the whole business is, is built on. And that it just doesn't seem to me to be justified given what we know about introspection and so forth and so on. So I think that if I was going to say, where does it go wrong? I'd say, so I want to believe, yeah, consciousness is real. I'm not going to deny that. But then when you say, well, then we have a transparent access to its nature through introspection, yeah. and then it's like, hit the brakes. <laughs> um, that's a kind of, that's a claim that seems to me roughly in tension with a lot of uh, psychological data, actually. So um, that's where I think I would most likely resist. I don't know about you. Yeah, and I, I do think that's where it hangs and falls. And, and we're getting more into the intricate of the debate now you know so that my popular book Galileo's error ever coming out I don't talk about this stuff at all it was a brief appendix actually but but I do think uh that this is and this is maybe where I disagree a little with David Chalmers on the you know that you know he sets things up in his two-dimensional semantic framework and I think that's just the sort of in some sense a distraction what is what it hangs and falls on is whether you think in introspection we have access to at least part of the essential nature of consciousness uh and i think we do so i think you know we a pain a pain is a feeling and um all there is to a feeling is how it feels and when you feel it you know how it feels and um and that that's what, that's what a feeling is so in some sense you you know the essential nature of the feeling when you feel it and you you attend to it um so, so if you do think we, if you deny that, if you think we have no introspective access to the essential nature of consciousness, then you've no way of ruling out that it could be bog standard physical properties. Um, you know, whereas if you do have access to its essential nature, then it looks pretty implausible. I mean, maybe you have to do a few extra moves, like the knowledge argument or something. That that it's um, that it's that it's not physical so i do think it hangs and falls on that but um i suppose i would uh dispute that there's any good reason to doubt that and i think there's good reasons in favor of it as well, well you know, i suppose, I suppose ju just just one look one, one problem so i suppose is that pre-theoretical is that i suppose i think that is um careful ref ca careful reflection on this on the pre-theoretical starting point leads you there so it's a sort of so there's this pre theory and you know, keith's talking about naive realism in some sense yeah naive realism is pre-theoretical common sense but there's also i think what gaden strawson's called deep common sense which is yeah. the you know what what seems to be the case after you've reflected and of course you can make the accusation that oh i've one has gone philosophically astray but that might not be the case it could be just that you know you'd think that you should it's better to trust what seems apparent after careful thought so so i would say careful thought on those cartesian starting point leads you to thinking as, as the, to put it in the jargon, jargon phenomenal concepts are transparent sorry go on i was going to say you might have gone empirically astray as opposed to philosophically astray so when right. i think about things like pain and asymbolia yeah. where people say yeah i feel the pain but there's no painfulness to it that seems to me you could either, I mean, there's two ways to interpret that. You could say, look, that's not a real pain because they don't have all the functional or feeling parts. Or you could say that is a real pain. It's just that being awful isn't part of the intrinsic nature of pain, that they come apart. Uh, you can have the pain without the awfulness, without the hurtiness, and it's still, it, they say it's a burning pain. It's an, you know, they, they can just need the intensity of it. So it's so is... conceptually coherent to say, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's the only way to interpret this condition, but it's conceptually coherent to say that there's a pain um, and it's the feeling part of it's not part of the intrinsic nature of the pain. That's something extra. That that's the way we interpret um, it. So just because I, so I think I do grasp the essential nature of a pain when I feel it. I don't think I, I don't think it. I have any kind of intuition that painfulness is essential to pain, or I, 
I guess. Okay, so it, what is the essential has, nature so, of the pain? You said it's a feeling, and I'm sort of suggesting that we have evidence that maybe it well, might it's, not be. It's sort of ineffable, isn't it? That's the, you know, it's what you know. You can't you can't put in other terms what it's like to feel pain or what it's like to see red. You know, this is the. Uh, but you. Yeah, you, you can. Know, you can you say know, it's more like pink than it is like blue. You can say okay. it's um, a stabbing or burning or that it's an awfulness that's you know that I'm averse to and I don't ever. There's lots of yeah. You can't precisely characterize so, it. There's other things you can say about it. Well, I think these are comparative notions, aren't they? Rather than uh, right. But but they're not the things that you know. Kit Fine has a nice thing between the, the the essence of something and what necessarily follows from the essence. Again, maybe that's getting a bit technical for certain. But but um, yeah, I think these are comparative notions. But you know, if, if someone, if if a if a congenitally blind person's never experienced color, they're they're never going to get on board with this game at all. They're not going to know what the hell are you talking about, saying it's more red than pink. So yeah, so I think you do know what. Well, it's more like a trumpet than a fax. Yeah, I suppose so. You can capture certain structural features of it or something. You know, Nagel has this cool part at the end of his bat paper where he says, let's try to do an objective phenomenology where we try to characterize what it's like to be a human in terms where you could try to explain it to someone who hadn't had the experience. And maybe they wouldn't understand it perfectly, but they would come some way towards knowing what it was like. And I'm not sure that's entirely impossible. We haven't done a yeah. good job at it, but uh, we haven't worked really hard at it. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So, I mean, it doesn't rule out that we, if even if we grasp the essential nature introspectively, it doesn't rule out that there are other ways of doing it. Maybe people who are more or less on my side, like Sam Coleman, think there could be ways of capturing the nature of ex experience without actually having the experience. But, um, but I still think that's so. That's that's not inconsistent with thinking that we grasp the essential nature consciousness and i don't think it's inconsistent with pain as symbolia or something you know the um if well, i why, thought why yeah. not because if anything that you say there's the essential nature and say oh there's the thing without it then sort of it's not the essential nature of it well when i oh i see what you mean uh well no i grasp the essential nature um well, I, yeah, I suppose I'd say that is in some way a different experience. If it's if it doesn't have the painfulness, it's in some way for the pain as symbolia person. I think it's in some way it's a different experience, right? If it doesn't but have the hurtiness, I see they, what you're saying. I think I was the intensity of it, and they say it's a stabbing pain, not a burning pain. Well, yeah. So, so the, I mean, there's there are lots of when I I loosely say you know the essential nature of pain, right? I, there are all these rough and ready ways of referring to experiences like, you know, the headache I had yesterday or the incredibly general and vague. That's not really what we, what we, are, what we grasp the essential nature of in, in experience. What we grasp the essential nature of is, you know, this experience I'm attending to right now. Chalmers calls these direct phenomenal concepts, direct experiential concepts. So it's that that I grasp the essential nature of. And, um, I take it that so the the pain asymbolia person grasps the nature of what they're experiencing right now. I grasp the nature of the pain I'm experiencing right now. We both call them pain, and that's a kind of rough and ready way of referring to this broad category of types of experience. But it's the very specific determinate experience that you grasp essential nature. Of. There isn't a danger that it's just going to come down to sort of this, whatever it is. Now, if it's just, well, yeah, something, look, something, when I'm in pain, well, it's, something's happening. Something's happening that's pretty momentous, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, yeah, something's happening. We can all agree on that. And that's perfectly compatible with realism of the most strongest forms or with illusionism, because you know, something is happening and I'm detecting that it's happening. Now, and, and, and maybe this is yeah. where I can sort of push on Richard a bit here, because um, well, everything you were saying to Philip there, I was, you know, with 100%. You know, so, I, I think, uh, so... What I my my sense is, yeah, I'm in pain. Something's happening. I'm detecting it. Uh, I'm representing it to myself in a certain way. I'm perhaps judging it as involving some ineffable qualia or qualia, whatever, of pain or the awfulness of it or whatever. Um, but I've no access to its direct access to its uh, to its actual nature. It may be vastly different from what I think it is. Um, uh, it, all I really know is that it's causing all these reactions in me. There's something there that's causing all these my reactions. And kind of my my sense of its reality is connected with all those reactions. I'm aware of what it's doing to me, the way it's pushing me. It's you know it's 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 
kind of doing all this stuff to me and that's what why it matters and if it wasn't doing anything to me it would kind of be nothing that's kind of now sorry that was very compressed what i want to ask richard is what he thinks i'm missing out there because obviously philip thinks i'm missing something very you know i'm missing out the sort of pure awfulness of the pain you know which doesn't you know, cannot be identified with just this cluster of reactions and stuff and the mechanisms that have brought from voting that have, uh, or my representations of my introspective representations of all that there is some underlying reality that grounds all of that somehow what do you think i'm missing out me you 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 me, Philip. Uh, yes. uh, oh richard. richard richard oh um well, I don't know. This is a bit a subtle question because actually this kind of gets to the heart of how I don't really think illusionism is a view, <laughs> um, that it's not a consistent view. Because, I mean, so it's a little bit like the debate between in, in free will between the compatibilists and the Clark for determinist. So the determinist says there is no such thing as free will. The compatibilist says, yeah, it is. You just misunderstood it. So I cannot help but hear the claim that you just made as a there is consciousness, but you misunderstood its nature. Um, so that's what I hear. I don't understand how it could mean anything other than that, to be honest with you. And so that's what I would say is what you're missing is that you just explained consciousness and said it doesn't exist. But you but you just don't want to you just don't want to come out and say, look, by consciousness, it's just this representing it to myself in a certain way, blah, blah, blah. You want to say, no, no, it's, it doesn't. It, it's not real. And that's the part where I. I really just am con confused. I'm not trying to like make a, you know, I know the try harder line. I've tried pretty hard and I just don't see what other else is to the claim. Well, look, if that's all it is, then it's just a, uh, it's just terminological. It's just, just a verbal difference. There's no, no real problem. I always pretty try to be quite explicit that what I'm denying the existence of is phenomenal consciousness in that very specific sense that's linked to all these thought experiments and the stuff that Mary couldn't know about and that zombies would lack and so on. And so I, I've tried to be, Clear that there's a particular fact of consciousness that I, uh, um, I deny the existence of consciousness in a particular sense. I don't deny the, you know, the fact that these experiences we call conscious experiences have interesting properties and so on. Yeah, like. but I don't see that. I don't see that. No, if, if that's your view, though, what, what I mean, I think you might be materialist. So you were, you were proposing kind of an identity. Someone breathing into a microphone, I can't. Sorry, that might be. That might be <laughs> Sorry, okay, <exactly. laughs> go ahead. I just couldn't hear you for a second. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, if if that if if you if if that's all it is, I mean, I'm, um, then I don't see why you need you need identities here because uh, at least you know type B kind of identities, brute identities, because. Uh, there, there, there's nothing more. You know, you've just anal you know you, you you've given a functional account of consciousness so there's no you don't need to posit any extra identity beyond that it just is all that functional stuff that's, that's causing all these reactions that have been represented in this way that's it end of story type a so but you tend to talk of yourself as a type b I well think. actually i tend to say that i am non-committed as between the two now, this is, we're back to good richard and bad richard aren't we yeah um, <laughs> well i'm just you know it's like i don't know why i have to pick one i think they're both plausibly there's arguments for them and I could see how a type A view could work, but I could see how type B view could work, and I don't really see that we have good reason to go for one or the other. So far, it seems to me perfectly consistent with an indeed, you know, supportive of a type A position. I haven't seen any reason for saying, and yet, it's, of course, there is kind of there is there is. I mean, I actually have a paper on this. Not not to interrupt you, but I have a paper on this called the identity theory in two D, where I try to try to. I mean, it's basically like a, a reasonable Frank Jackson. You know, I don't want to. Um, but anyway, so that I think that actually, yeah, that there is a way that you can go from giving a kind of functional characterization of consciousness as involving awareness of, of mental states and then find out what is doing that here and then make the identity so you kind of get a Lewisian identity as opposed to a kind of type B identity. So I'm not against the type A move. I just think it really depends on what the functional characterization of consciousness is, you know, and I'm not always 100% sure that you can really get that so I could I vacillate you know between the kind of mental pain no no functional description so I don't know but I'm, I'm not sure why I have to they're both good materialist views and I, I would defend either one depending on who I'm talking to but I'm not really they are good both good materialist views I'd, I'd be interested in what Philip thinks about this because I think one is you know the, the type A one is 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 that the, the, the 
there's no question about that being a, a coherent materialist view. Uh, it's essentially the same as mine, I think. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot of details. Um, but the other one, it does seem to me that there's some kind of extra property here that, you know, the, the, with which the identity is being made. So there's an extra property. Um, yeah, but that's not how identities work. Identities don't take two properties and identify them. Identities say there's only one property. Well, okay. Um, so what so is that's, I mean, that's one of my complaints. A lot of people, that's a Jack Smart, you know, objection and everything. A lot of people say, well, yeah, you're doing this identity, but there's two things there. But that just misunderstands the nature of identity. If the identity is truly only one thing. Tell, do we need to explain to viewers watching this what type A and type B are? Or are we assuming? Yeah, probably. I mean, yeah. I will just mention that someone shouted out uh, Eric Switch Gable's book, Sexy of Consciousness, about how terrible um, introspection is. I would just like to... Maybe we'll come back to that because there's a lot of a lot of reason to doubt getting back to getting up on Keith so that you guys won't gang up on me. <laughs> but yeah, so why don't why don't we say a little bit about what the type A type B distinction is? Does anyone want to do that? Shall I do that or do you? Yeah, um, you do. yeah go ahead. Uh, I can't remember how you make this distinction. Uh, well, I guess type B is more uh, usually. I guess think zombies are incoherent, that, that we define conscious states just in functional or behavioral terms to feel pain. Pain is a matter of um, a certain kind of response, behavioral response to bodily damage. Uh, so you ju that's just part of the meaning of mental terms. Whereas the type B position is, a, is an empirical identity. So you say... Yeah, zombies are conceivable because consciousness, con mental concepts and physical concepts are completely different and you'd never know that they were the same thing. But science has showed us that they are the same thing, right. just like water and H2O. So you wouldn't know a priori sat in your armchair that water was H2O molecules, but um, turns out it is. So yeah, so you wouldn't know that pain was a kind of brain activity, but turns out it is. So it's not true by definition, but it's it's uh, it's true as it's a matter of It's not entailed by like, any description. Yeah, uh, but I think actually I think this is where I'm more on uh, Richard's side than Keith's side actually, which cuts cuts the the original map mm -hmm. because I yeah I, I have a lot of respect for the I like everyone's view I, <laughs> for the type B position because if or at least the version of it people like David Papano think you know. Um, when I, so the view as I understand it, when I think I'm introspecting, I'm thinking about my pain in terms of how it feels. Uh, I'm kind of pointing at something inside myself, but I, but I've got no access to what it is. I'm just pointing at something. I don't know what the hell it is. You know, if turns you have that view, state. then it, then it, it turns out to be a brain state. What's wrong with that view? That seems to me a perfectly sensible view. What I dispute is what we were arguing about earlier, that I think that's a crazy view of our mental concepts, that I think when you attend to your pain, you do know at least something about its nature. That's why you care when other people are in pain, because it's terrible. And uh, But you both dispute that. <laughs> Keith disputes. So given that... Then, well, I don't uh, dispute what? that. I think you know something about its experiential uh, nature, but not its physical nature. So that's why I think it's more of a translucent... Oh, yeah, we had a big argument about this in the... Yeah, we did. <laughs> so, 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 what, what's wrong with the Type B view? I think. Well, just, I'm just coming back. Well, okay, so yeah, coming yeah. back on that. It depends. I think. You, I think that, that we build in a lot more into these sort of introspective demonstratives than we think. Um, so, if what you're doing is saying, "Look, yeah, something's happening in me. Something's happening in me. I have no idea what it is," and it turns out that you no, know, it's well, yeah, fine. It turns out it's a basic. Make that identification. Fine. That's no problem with that. So then we, we, we're thinking of, of consciousness in quite a different way. We're thinking of pain, not in terms of all the reactions of this, but we're just thinking of something's happening right now. Something that is associated with all these reactions. Yeah, fine, I've no problem with that at all. And if that's what being a type B physical is, then I'm, I am one. If uh, you, but I don't think we do we mean that. We mean something, and then, you know, these demonstratives, these concepts that we aspire are supposed to be phenomenal ones. They're supposed to somehow pick out something that is kind of distinctive in some way. What way? Well, it's supposed to be in the sort of way that supports all these thought experiments that could be inverted. We use the word qualitative, though what, exa how, what exactly do we mean by that? I don't know. But we, we, we have some more 
substantial theoretical grip on it than just whatever's happening now in me. Or, or at least I, th I think a lot of people do. And now once you start reporting all that, then I'm not on board with identifying that with a brain state because it's quite, uh, uh, yeah, th th this brain state, you know, could be this, you know, this, whatever it is that's happening in me now could be quite different to whatever it is that's happening. It could be inverted. It doesn't, you can't run these thought experiments. Mary could know everything that's happening in me now, but not know what. There isn't, you know, if, if it's as clear as that, then type B is, e, type B identities are easy, but also very uninteresting. Maybe, it, maybe it depends on whether you, th whether you think all those thought experiments are essentially connected to phenomenal transparency, grasping the essential nature of consciousness. So I, I, as I understand it, the type B position would pick out the notion of consciousness through these thought experiments, through the Nagel expressions being something that it's like to be. But then they say that those very concepts uh, don't reveal the essential nature of their reference. Uh, so it's not just... It's not just like we an artificial concept, like whatever's going on inside me, like Jack Smart had. It's the 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 original, you know, the, our original concepts that Nagel picks out, that the thought experiments pick out. Uh, those very concepts don't reveal the essential nature of the reference. Well, the, the, the trouble is, those uh, concepts. Once you start, you know, conceptualizing what's happening in you in terms of those concepts, you end up going down this this strongly Cartesian road if you're not careful. And then you can sort of say, well, I don't want to. Careful, I'll just make these identities and say, I don't really know what these things are. But at the same time, these, these notions are doing all this sort of kind of uh, intuition pumping, as Danny would put it. You know, they're, they're, they're doing two things. They're saying that they're, apparently when you're being a type B materialist, they're just very thin and you can just identify them with any old physical stuff. At the same time, they're doing a lot of sort of uh, metaphysical heavy lifting and getting you into a sort of property. And I don't think the same concept can be doing both of those things at the same time. So I think I think the, Papineau I think sorry no, 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 no. No. I, I think Papineau would say it's not the concept that's leading us astray it's just we just have this very strong intuition that consciousness can't be physical and that's just an intuition that maybe needs a psychological explanation but it's not the concept that's leading us astray uh, well again I mean how you how you separate the boundaries you know, between the concepts and the theory that's embedding them I mean it's just a messy thing but this is kind of one reason I mean why do I take this kind of apparently, you know, boneheaded position of, you know, it's not like anything, but because I'm trying to divert us into a different way of thinking of this stuff. Okay, I'm trying to get rid of these. Okay, why am I trying to get rid of the concepts or the theory that's embedding them? I mean, I don't know, just, just you know, as Dan, Dan Dennett says, you know, cut the tangled kite string. Instead of trying to sort this out, let's just try and frame a better way of, of looking at it in terms of... Um, but, but, but Keith, I mean... I don't see you doing that because what you, I mean, the way you started out, you say, look, you know, there's a world out there, there are, there are colors, the colors are on the surfaces of the world. That's what it's like. <laughs> That's what it, so the Edenic stuff is about what it's like for us to experience the world. So you're not denying that there's something that it's like for us. You're just characterizing it in a, in a very thin way, but I, I don't see you, and this goes back to your earlier, my earlier, I don't understand the distinction you're trying to make between phenomenal consciousness and consciousness. I'm going to run out of battery, so I'm just going to plug myself in. Carry on. Okay. okay. <laughs> the, the starting point was was just was partly a tactical point against 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 Philip. Was you know our starting point isn't with the Cartesianism; it's with the, the Edenic world. So I mean, I, I'm not attached. I've got, I've got any special attachment to oh hello uh, to that oh, sorry, um, sorry. To, to that to that starting point. I do think that's kind of pre theoretical starting point, um, but. Yeah, that's that's not important claim. But you're um, not denying that there's something that it's like. You're, you you just characterize what it's like for us as being identical. I resist that talk. I, I'm I'm resisting that whole prod that whole way of conceptualizing consciousness of which that term is a part. And you know Nagel's use of it. I mean, it's, it, it, these things are not they're embedded in 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 in, in theoretical approaches to consciousness. You can't just say you know I, I know, what I mean, what it's like is the most you know vacuous term in itself. Um, it, it only starts to get meaning. I mean, it look, what's, what's nice about that? <laughs> Not nice, but what's, what makes it a, 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 a very useful intuition pump is that it seems quite innocuous. You know what it's like? It's like something. Of course it's like something. We all talk on this way all the time. But it's then used in, the, in, in various kinds of uh, 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 theoretical approaches to consciousness 
uh, bound up with these, you know, what will Mary not know? She wouldn't know what it's like. Right. What, what, what it, but it's not like, and now you're taking this innocent term and doing some stuff with it that you've no right to do on the basis of that, of that innocent, the way it was innocently introduced. But people um, do that all the time. They say, if you're blind, you don't know what it's like to see red. If you haven't tasted pineapple, you don't know what it's like to taste pineapple. That's innocuous. That's, yeah, you, and Mary's, you know, building extra stuff in there. And I don't think the conclusion is dualism, obviously, because I think that if Mary had the concept phenomenal red, then she would be able to make these deductions to the no. physical substrate. So I don't think that you have to, but certainly you can't, it seems off, absurd to say that she doesn't learn what it's like to see red when she sees red. I mean, that's, and that's, that's a normal way of talking. That's the way ordinary persons talk. Look, I've no problem with the ordinary way of talking. I've no problem with, you know, uh, hetero phenomenology with people's reports of what things, you know, how things are with them. Of course I'm not. And we take those as, you know, authoritative in the sense that we don't question them. If someone sincerely tells you this is how it, you know, it feels, whatever, yeah, we take that, that's a datum. We just don't treat it as, an, as a transparent window on some inner reality. That's the difference. And that's, right. I think you agree with me. And that's what I was saying to, to Philip earlier, right? But that's a theoretical claim, not just, but you want to deny that there is even something that it's like because it leads to the theoretical claim. Whereas I'm saying, I agree with you. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just insisting that, you know, that, that, there is, that there isn't a transparent window, that yes, there's talk of what it's like, and it's important part of our practice with each other and understand each other. It falls an incredibly important social function. I mean, that, and, and indeed, uh, what we call consciousness is probably involved for, um, for, for social purposes, I, I tend to think. Um, but what, but, what what we take seriously is just the report, the report of no, people saying that. Something is, hello, something, that, 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 look, something is, the report is sensitive to something. These things, these reports are not random. We just don't. How do you know, how, why, how do you know, how do you know it's not, it's sensitive to something? I mean, what? Because we're able to, you know, we're able to engage with each other in various ways on the basis of these reports in the ways that, you know, we, the, 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 these reports do an awful lot of work for us in a way they wouldn't if consciousness were epiphenomenal or just, you know, uh, uh, Absolutely intrinsic, I, I think. But anyway, don't go. So you know, they do work for us. They, they they earn their keep. Now, what we just don't we don't do is 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 is, is see those reports as a transparent window and some inner reality that is hidden from us and could be different from what it is in other people and so on. And so, and if all the reactions and reports are the same, then it's the same, you know. Um, so uh, and. Uh, it seems to me, the one, on the one hand, Richard, you're wanting to sort of take this kind of talk. You want to say there's more than just, as it were, the reports and the, and the, and the associated behaviors and so on, uh, and whatever causes them. What causes them is consciousness. <laughs> yeah, but you want to, you wanted to say that what causes them is is is, is not transparent to us because right. our inspection is not transparent. So how do you yeah. know that what causes them is anything that? I mean, if we're just conscious, it's just going to be a word for what I call the quasi-phenomenal properties, whatever it is that is causing these reports, that these reports are sensitive to, then I'm with you. I mean, then it's just terminological. But if you're wanting to take uh, to accept that what's um, that what their these reports are, are reports are, excuse me, going to tell you, that what these are reports are is something of which all these various um, uh, 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 claims about Mary and zombies and inversions and so on are true. Then, then I'm not with you. Well, they're all epistemically true. This is they are those claims about epistemology. They're not claims about metaphysics. Mary is an is a knowledge. It's what she knows. Uh, inversion is about how can I know about your. So these are knowledge claims, and that's not metaphysics. So I'm not saying that it's true that there could be inversions. I think that's an open question. Um, I don't even know if it's conceivable. I mean, it depends on color, you know, how those color spaces are and who knows what falls off. But the point, though, is, is that you're, I don't think I'm, I need to do all that stuff that you're saying to just maintain the common sense play and the consciousness is real. And that I can conceive, it seems like at least prima facie in my room at night when I was 15, I was like, yeah, you know, uh, this could be a dream and there's still red over there. And how do I know that my itch, my pain feels like your pain? That was a thought I had when I was very young and I was trying to explain to the doctor how it hurts. And so, I mean, those things are epistemic in nature. And then you can, and then you can argue, oh yeah, well, they don't reflect the real nature of the thing. And that's exactly. what I do argue, but that's well, that, not, uh, Sorry, go ahead. That's the illusion, isn't that? Because yeah, it, that's how we represent internal reality. Once, at least, once we've done a little bit of reflection, uh, innocent or not, 
Yeah, that's how we represent it. That's that's how we. Well, well, everyone is a weak illusionist. There's no escaping weak illusionism. We conceptualize our mental lives on, with phenomenal concepts, and I think phenomenal concepts radically misrepresent. Basically, illusionism is the phenomenal concept strategy with the rider that these radically misrepresent. That's why it's an illusion. Yeah, I think that's illusion. Yeah, see, because everyone's an illusionist in that sense. I mean, maybe the radical part is where the gradations will occur, but I mean, sure, even, but I even Chalmers, even even David Chalmers says these organic sure. properties are illusionary. They don't represent things out there, so in a sense, they're an illusion. So everybody's, yeah, everybody's an illusionist in some weak sense. A weak, weak illusionist. I'm, I'm strong enough to the point that I don't think there's a hard problem. Put it like that. And that's just type A. I mean, you don't need to be an illusionist to be a type A physicalist. Um, well, I kind of think that there's, I mean, there may be a bit of daylight between between the two, but I think they're pretty close to, because, I mean, type A physical, type A physical is often described precisely as eliminativism. I think Chalmers, I just, just, just don't do that. It's often but regarded just, as pretty much. Well, limitivism is not illusionism. I mean, I assume there's a no, difference. No, limitivism stresses the positive part of the program, which is not just denying the reality of, the, of, of consciousness in the Cartesian phenomenal sense, but also trying to explain our intuitions about it. That's So you know, the, the, the way I character, and I want to give Philip a chance to, I see him being patient, but I, I just want to say the way I characterize these debates is as a debate between, so a limitivism to me is, can't be a real view, unless what it means is that there is a certain metaphysically loaded conception, which I don't accept. So for instance, in, in the neuroscience textbook, I teach introduction to neuroscience. And in the textbook, the first chapter of the neuroscience book, they say they are, they, they are limited materialists and that they, there's no mind or consciousness. But then in the next paragraph, what they say is, oh, what we mean by that is that these aren't non-physical things and we can explain everything physically. So that's not a limitivism. That's just they're saying we want to eliminate this weird conception of the thing that we're trying to talk about, I'm not getting rid of the thing you want to talk about. That's exactly what uh, I see illusion. illusion says. The weird conception is an illusion, and the task. So we eliminate the weird conception and we try to explain why we have it. That's so, almost exactly what I see as illusion. So I think Keith. I mean. So Keith is saying when we get involved in the zombies and Mary and so on, we're going wrong. But I think what the you know what the type B person says, and I think I'm kind of backing up what Richard said earlier. Sorry, ganging up on you. Um, what the type B person says is no, 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 no. The 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 the, the Mary stuff, the zombie conceivability, and the mo that's all epistemic. That's all follows from the fact that physical and phenomenal concepts are different. Uh, and that's they are different and that's fine and so zombies are conceivable of course it's a mistake if you accept the conclusion of the argument but it's not a mistake just to think that zombies are conceivable or that you know that mary would gain new propositional knowledge so so to that extent you get into the thought experiments without going wrong um what do, it seems to me that 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 were the that were the materialist has to say you do go wrong has to be just with the phenomenal trans Transparency of it. When you get to the right. point where you your intuition is that, you know, in these in having these concepts, we grasp the essential nature yeah. of consciousness. Then the materialist has to say that that's going wrong. Then there's an interesting question over here about. I, I thought Keith thought that was our natural concept, but now I'm getting more the impression that it's it's actually a concept you get to when you go a bit wrong philosophically, which to me yeah. it makes it less of an illusionist position. The illusion, the true illusionist position, should be it's just our natural ordinary concepts. A very interesting short paper by David Lewis, Should Materialists Believe in Qualia, where he basically says he, our ordinary notion of, we do have an ordinary notion of qualia, he thinks. We don't have a term for it, but he thinks people catch on to it so easily that there must be a folk concept in some sense. And he thinks, basically, he, he, he seems to think it does involve something like what I'd call phenomenal transparency. Uh, and right. he says, that's what you have to deny. And then he kind of says, whether you call this illusion, illusionism, eliminativism, or revisionism yeah, is right. is kind of terminological. It's a bit like you have someone in the free will debate, you know, the difference between that, the, the, the compatibilist who says they're a revisionist or the hard determinist might be a bit terminological. But yeah, so that's what it seems to me. So maybe I, I'm, I'm not sure I, this might be... Disagreeing with Keith, I think I think the type B person can say, "No, you, you do fine. You're not going wrong when you get, think zombies are conceivable." 
Uh, it's just the philosophical error of inferring from that that they're possible. Um, or actually, I would qualify that by just saying that it's that they're prima facie conceivable. That's where you don't go wrong. I think you actually do go wrong if you start from their conceivability, because I don't, I don't think they are conceivable ultimately. And I've you know tried to argue for that in various places. But certainly, what I can't, I don't deny is that they're prima facie conceivable. So they seem conceivable. Lots of people think that they're conceiving of them. I don't think you can deny that. I don't think that's a bad place to start. Just a couple of, uh, uh, yeah. just a couple. By of the way, just th this might be useful because someone was just asking us uh, if Keith could define illusion from Steve. So thanks. For, I wonder if that might help us if you would say a little bit about what is an illusion on your view. Uh, yeah. A systematic misrepresentation, something like that. You know, a representation that's a misrepresentation that systematically happens in you know certain certain situations. That's something like that. Not not a lot should be built into. You know, you, you, there's no point doing a lot of uh, sort of um, ordinary language philosophy on the word illusion. It's just a, a label. Just to respond to Philip, uh, if I can, if I can remember what I was going to say. Um, so I'm getting a bit, a bit uh, I need a cup of tea. So uh, one question about whether whether the illusion is a natural sort of feature, you know, sort of feature of our int or a bug or a feature of our introspective system, or whether it's the product of theory. Um, I used, I, I was, um, you know, I, I, I really like Nick Humphrey's book, uh, Soul Dust. He kind of doesn't like the word illusion, uh, illusionism any longer, but his Soul Dust was a lovely version of the, the sort of innate uh, uh, illusion idea, the idea it's actually an, an, an evolved feature of our introspective systems, you know, to, to, to create this, this 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 sense that we have this, this Cartesian uh, world, and it was a lovely book. But uh, the way I see illusionism just as a program is that it's a kind of spec. That, 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 that there's going to be two components. There's going to be some sort some features of our introspective system, the nature of introspection itself, and there's going to be some sort of theoretical gloss on that, and you can combine these two in different proportions. Maybe on some views, it's almost, you know, it's kind of hardwired into our introspective systems that as soon as you start thinking about this, you immediately default to that position. On others, it's that introspection is much more sort of open and we interpret it, there's a heavy theoretical gloss on it. So I don't, I see illusionism as a, as a program, as a broad church, and you could be anywhere along that spectrum. And I sort of move back and forth along it a bit in different times. So that I don't, uh, just, just for how we use the term, I'd like to keep it open. Um, the key of this, and uh, the key thing here, I think, this is absolutely central to the debate and the disagreements, and Philip pointed to it there, is, is the notion of transparency and acquaintance. I think that is the absolute core of it. And if there was one thing that I wanted to, to if you, I mean, what's my core commitment in thinking about conscience, is to deny acquaintance. And I think everything else pretty much follows from that. Uh, and I think that is actually the, what's the word for like a sort of deep dividing point between two views, you know, the chasm between them is the people who believe in acceptance and the people who don't. And I think that's the only really significant theoretical choice. Yeah, after that, it's theory building on each side of the chasm. And we, we can agree on that. I mean, that's what I've tried to push in a lot of, you know, my <laughs> academic work and where I think I, in some sense, disagree with David Chalmers or, you know, yeah. That is where it hangs and falls. I'm not sure about whether I'd put it acquaintance, but wh whether you grasp the whether introspectively grasp the central nature of consciousness, I think it does. Yeah, I, I agree. It hangs and falls on that, in, in my view. Can, can I just jump in because I mean, this sounds like I'm going to make a boneheaded comment. I guess I always do that, so I shouldn't be too But so I mean, it just kind of occurred to me, and I feel kind of dumb for it just occurring to me. But obviously, illusionism is a view about introspection. Right. It's the it's the illusion is an introspective illusion. Um, but, but why do we need introspection? Because my belief in consciousness barely involves introspection. I think ordinary conscious experience without introspection is is the thing where we're trying to that we're trying to explain in the starting place. And so I'm, I'm just not. So even if there is an introspective illusion, why should that have anything to do with consciousness itself being real or illusionary? Okay, uh, this is something I've been I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working, uh, writing on at the moment, and actually, my position is evolving to something that is very much a higher order uh, position. And I think you have the sort of you have the kind of mechanisms of first order representational mechanisms, and you have the the processes of access consciousness and so on. And I think that's all pretty much gone without it engaging the illusion as it were 
you know that's 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 the yes, default mode of operation where you're just in the world and you're not reflecting on it and of course you're aware of the world in some sense you're you're there in the world but you're not there in the world as a conscious experiencer of the world as it is and i think the um uh, our talk of phenomenal consciousness so on sort of starts to kick in when you do engage higher order representations which are sensitive to um i think sensitive to not directly to, to just to the representational states involved but to the whole wider psychological effects of those states the kind of the impact that the thing is making on you associatively uh, emotionally um, the priming effects that it's having all this kind of stuff and i think that's all sort of swept up into a kind into what we call phenomenal concepts and kind of attributed to the object that's causing them so red, our sense of redness is a sense of a power in the object to do all this to me where this is referring to the all the psychological effects and reactive dispositions that are arising from my seeing that thing so the, 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 the and so you know, for instance mary wouldn't know about red in this sense because she wouldn't have all the associations that redness has for us part of the sense the richness of redness is 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 my is, is, is drawn from my experience of red things and what red things mean for me and how they and how they prime me and how they so it's this impact the world makes on us which we conceptualize under some sort of phenomenal concept and kind of project out what we see it as a power in the world to create that stuff and that comes in with this kind of higher order stuff now uh, i still think don't think of that in realist terms i don't think that's explaining you know uh, that's explaining our intuitions about phenomenal consciousness rather than explaining you know it's, it's, i mean if you want to say that i don't want to put it in realist terms because i want to stop people thinking of those terms because i think that distracts them and gets them going down the wrong <laughs> That's why I, said, Goodrich and, I don't think Goodrich and Badrich are, are any are, are that much different. I just think <laughs> the danger is that Badrich might get people thinking in a way that, he, that they shouldn't be thinking. It's, it's <laughs> not exactly any different. It's the same person. Anyway, so I can't remember what question I saw we were talking for. Well, no, that <laughs> might, I was just wondering about this distinction between introspection and consciousness. And yeah, so yeah, that's, that's, it sounds that's, like you're saying you're a realist about consciousness. It's just that introspection misrepresents it and then gives us the wrong idea about it's what it is but consciousness is there in the ordinary pre-reflective sense there's the reds the blues i'm not focusing on them but they're there i mean that, that that's consciousness it's when, introspection when it, seems like an extra step and that's a some of those an illusion there doesn't seem to affect the the ground floor stuff i, 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 I mean I, i'm really sorry uh, it's, it's, I just, I'm really resistant to this idea of using the word conscious because, you know, as Liz Irvine points out, there's all sorts of things we could pin that label on. There's all kinds of discriminations at different levels which have different degrees of effects and which can be tested for in different ways. Uh, and we could, you know, there's, there's conscious, there, there different kinds of words. I think she says schmonsciousness, there's, there's schmonsciousness, long schmonsciousness, there's all kinds of different uh, perceptual and reactive states that we could pin the label on. What is this? Consciousness. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in a sense, it's whatever this stuff is. But this stuff is multi-dimensional, multifaceted. And once we start, you know, trying to pull it apart and do actual science on it, this notion of, you know, this world of consciousness breaks down. All that we're left with is the illusion of this unitary world of consciousness. It's multiple draft stuff again. You know, there's all kinds of where's it all come together? It doesn't all come together. It just seems to all come together when we probe ourselves. Okay, Philip. Maybe please. maybe I can just put it a slightly different angle. I guess we spent a lot of time thinking, you know, what's it's just been a really interesting discussion actually. I'm really about, you know, what's hardwired into it or where does where do we go wrong and so on. But, you know, it seems to me that both of your views have to deny something that seems pretty evident. Keith has to deny that we're we're acquainted with, with our conscious state. Uh Richard denies that you, you know, has has to accept that conscious states are identical with electrochemical signaling or that, that you know seems pretty itself seems pretty hard to make coherent sense of my view is the only one that doesn't have to deny anything <laughs> and uh and you know if that if that led to the reason people were put off except taking these things that seem evident as true was because it seems to lead to dualism which is empirically dubious but you know the great thing about this rust leddington panpsychism is it gives you a way of accepting these things which seem, you know, to most people as evident as two plus two is four, uh, you know, uh, without, in a way that's consistent with everything we know scientifically. So, so, so it's mine, though. I don't I deny win. anything that's, uh, I don't, but that's an unfair characterization because I don't deny any of that stuff. I, so, in fact, I think you have to deny the, the thing here that's 
that uh, is the important thing, which is that the consciousness as we have it is what consciousness is. <laughs> because what, what your view is that there's some microphysical other kind of thing, which is consciousness, but super simple or whatever. And that seems to me to be the more radical thing than, this, than to say that it's uh, electrical, electrophysical. I mean, okay. these micro phenomenal properties there, we have no reason to believe that there are any such thing. Whereas we have tons of reason to believe that there's ordinary conscious properties. Yeah, I'm not and saying tons of reasons to believe there are electrical chemical properties. So it, it seems to me that I'm not the one denying anything, and I don't really care about winning. But you know, I win. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's not radical or it's not. My point is, you don't have to deny these things that seem pretty evident. That, well, what am uh, I denying? That uh, that a feeling of pain is literally identical with a with, with a kind of brain activity. It, it, well, as that's not a denial. True. That's an assertion. Uh, well, yeah, what would be denying? Denying? Uh, w w what seems evident is that that is not the case. <laughs> but not many people don't find that evident. I mean, you know, Democritus didn't think that was evident. Hobbes right. didn't think that was evident. So you can cherry pick all the people who have thought that was evident. I'll cherry pick all the people who haven't thought that. So I think that whole, you know, oh, it's so hard is, is just cherry picking. Because ask, ask the undergraduates. Half of them say it's obviously the brain. Half of them say it can't be. I don't think no, that's fair, fair point, fair point. I guess it, I guess it comes about what, what I do think is evident is is the transparency stuff that in some sense you know uh, yeah i do have to deny that yeah, yeah. but i but, think that there's good empirical reasons for that and that's a different debate but i i actually think the thing you have to deny that you know that my experience of red is is um basic <laughs> is even more radical because the, it, the experience of red is made up by these other micro phenomenal parts who knows what they are i won't even talk about how they bond together or i know your stuff but who, who cares about the combination problem just that there are parts to the phenomenal experience of red does not sit well with the ordinary notion of the experience of red. So right. I think that's actually a more serious issue there than, than this other one. Yeah. yeah. It's not it's introspectively or it, meaning aware that it could be parts to, to the redness. It seems kind of yeah. basic and that, that seems radical to me. So I'm not saying, I mean, I'm, I'm friendly to panpsychists maybe in a way that other people I know aren't, because uh, I generally think these problems are hard, and I don't, uh, I'm, you know, I, I don't endorse it, but I don't think that. Yeah, you know, I know I said death first, but I was mostly kidding about that. I, I just don't think that there are really. I, I think the empirical stuff overrides the intuitive stuff at a certain point. And whereas I'm on board I mean, with the intuitive stuff, I just think that once, like what Keith was saying, once you start getting into the details about how bad we are in suspicion, um, yeah, I just, it just I, becomes I, I never, less obvious that that's the way you should stick. I mean, there was that question put forward by Eric Fitzgabel's book. And, you know, I just think there's too quick from, and, you know, Dennett does as well. There's these really cool and interesting mistakes we make about our own conscious experience. Fine, but I don't, wh why does that entail? I don't think that entails the falsity of phenomenal transparency because the claim is very specific claim about a very specific kind of experiential concept what Chalmers calls direct phenomenal concepts. So the claim is, you know, when I attend to a very specific determinate feeling I'm having right now, and I think about it in terms of, just in terms of what it's like, that's the kind of nature revealing concept. I've never seen anything, any of these cool things about, it's not saying we never get anything wrong, we're, you know, we're completely far. So I've never seen a good argument from empirical data as to why that's wrong. Um, What's wrong with the sampling data that Eric has, where where they do the beeper stuff and they have people report, and you get all these really wild? I mean, there's no agreement. There's nothing like like what you're saying. But it seems like if there were direct phenomenal concepts, they would come out there. So what, what's the setup? Tell me about the setup. People go about their daily business and they have a beeper, and when the beeper goes off, they're supposed to stop and reflect on what's happening right then and, and report it. And uh, it's, I forget what the it's from sample, some kind of I forget the name of it, but it's. Um, supposed to try to get people in their day-to-day -day life to stop and or focus on their conscious experience and to report what's happening right then at that moment. And you get all kinds of variations. People make mistakes or not even sure that what, what, you know, what's going on, what they can say. So just, it doesn't seem to be the uniformity that you're, you're expecting. When oh, you're maybe, I should, maybe I should have a look at that and um, see, see what I think about it. Sounds Interesting, but I mean, yeah, I, mean, I suppose a lot of the time you're not constantly, if you've ever, I meditate every morning, you know, and you, you, 
you're not attending and you're drifting off and you you know there's also so you know these very specific kinds of concept where you are attending uh you know and form your concept on that basis so i guess i'd want to know whether these are such cases that we're th thinking of and um I mean, you might think I'm dodging the question by making it such a specific kind of <laughs> concept that you, you can never go wrong. But, uh, you know, I, the claim is not based in em empirical support. It's based in um, a certain view about consciousness that it is. I mean, there's, there's, there's a general problem about, about these kind of direct concepts. Because, and this is something we've talked about before, but I just don't. I wonder if Keith has something to say about this. But it, it just really seems like it'd be really hard to ever like talk to people about consciousness if there were if it was all based on the direct i mean it's a kind of like a relative of the private language argument right um it's it's when i say i'm in pain and you say no you're not we're using pain in the same way in that sentence in those two sentences and not yeah. in a public way so there, there doesn't seem a really good way to make these kinds of things part of the public discourse but obviously we talk about our states to each other all the time well, I suppose we we are able to categorize our experiences in rough and ready ways, and in some way we're hardwired to uh, have a theory of mind in some sense. To you know, I guess we all agree on that. You know, to assume, but I think we're hardwired, you know, to interpret people as um, as having certain kind of experiences, and and we have those experiential concepts from our own case, but we're sort of hardwired to apply them to others in certain circumstances. If someone's crying, you're hardwired to. Uh, so yeah, I've never seen why that isn't a way around the um, private language argument worries that it's, I mean, it's, there might be philosophical concerns about, you know, why does evolution get this right rather than just, just doing what's good for survival? Why does it get us the right theory of mind? I mean, but, you know, big philosophical issues there, but. It, it's just more that when you say I'm in pain and you're expressing a direct phenomenal concept, and I say, no, you're not in pain. I have to be using a public language concept. And so we're not oh. talking about the same thing anymore. And yet, obviously, we always do talk about the same thing when we speak to each other in these ways. I don't think we are using a direct phenomenal concept. Direct phenomenal concepts are quite weird. You know, they're quite unusual. Most of the time, we're using non-direct phenomenal concepts. I mean, I, I guess in some sense, non-direct phenomenal concepts are derived from direct phenomenal concepts. But, 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 when I, well, but most of the time, we use non-direct ones. I think. Sorry. Uh, I'd have taken I, us off a weird tangent here. Sorry, come. No, sorry, I, I, I just wonder if I could come in on a slightly different angle on this. Yeah. Hanging up on Philip now. Uh, one thing that we, we, we agree that acquaintance is central here. One thing that bothers me about that is who is the subject of this acquaintance relation? So um, now, I guess. On Panpsychic's view, the subject is the physical object that corresponds to the uh, amalgamation the, of, of, of the relevant microphysical consciousnesses. But have we any idea? In your case, for instance, what is that? Is it your a bit of your visual cortex? Is it your is it your entire brain? Is it your entire central nervous system? Is it your is it, is it your body? I mean, are your glasses part of it? I mean, and, and how many of these are associated with your body? And how does this acquaintance relationship between that physical object and these properties then get translated into reports issued by your cognitive system? Okay, a lot of different questions there. I mean, the, the panpsychists needn't think that the subject is an indivisible thing that continues over time, and there's only one thing. You know, it could it could be changing parts of the brain over time. And um, but look, it's an open empirical question, isn't it? I take it w w what we're all looking for, or you know, a lot a lot of people working on the science of consciousness. You know, the neural correlates of consciousness and different theories were different different views about that. So I suppose. You know, the, the subject is whatever is the bearer of the neural correlates of consciousness at that particular moment. So yeah, so it's going to be a large part of the brain. Um, you know, and you know, well, this is a general theory. So I, you know, the, as I see things, the neutral data is correlations between conscious 
states and brain states and then you need a theory mm -hmm. uh you know and, and this is one very general theory so ultimately you've got to bring together the science and the you know without Without the philosophy, people think you just make progress by doing neuroscience. Well, you can do if you take the illusionist view, fair enough. But, but if, if, if you're a realist about consciousness, you, you can't just do neuroscience. Neuroscience just gives you correlations. And then you need a theory that explains those correlations. So we need to bring the, the philosophical theory and the science together. And this is what people are doing, like uh, Hedda Hassel Merck spent a year in the lab of Tononi, you know, interpreting that empirical theory of integrated information theory in a panpsychist framework uh, uh, so so that's answered that but then you should I come back to the, you, to I guess the, but, but can I just real fast say but you could also take like a Chalmers view where and take a deflationary view of the self but he can still be a panpsychist you yeah could also have Galen's view Strassen's view his, his mad view which is that each individual experience is a self experiencing it so that they somehow go together or you um, can be a bundle of, theorist that the self right, is there's lots of views that you can have right yes yeah, so you don't have to be, be follow descartes in thinking you know there's right an indivisible substance yeah exactly. um, yeah no, but it's interesting now how this is sort of uh, undermining sort of dissolving the one of our start one of what seemed to our starting points about the, the nature of the self and our self-awareness and self-consciousness of myself as a unitary experiencing being, which was one of the things certainly that Descartes thought we could start, uh, start with. Uh, it doesn't, of that a bit. doesn't have to be the same o o over time. It doesn't have to be, it, you know, I don't think we, I don't think you have Cartesian certainty that against Galen view for example so galen's view is you know you're a new self every three seconds yeah i don't think cartesian considerations can rule that out because all that's not doubtable is you know your experience right now or, um, well, I mean, well certainly but that's certainly not how they kind of conceived it he thought he was a persisting substance i assume i think that was his that was his ultimate view because but i think you i think well, you have to know, <laughs> Can I just or he argues I, against that? I think, I think you have to go through God not deceiving us to get that. Mm -hmm. I don't think Descartes thought what you're immediately aware of is is yourself as a persisting substance. I don't think I, I don't know. I'm not a Descartes scholar, but no, no. Okay. Can I come back then? To this? I mean, I thought people have even argued that Descartes wasn't really a substance dualist, and he uses oh yeah, substance. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, there's room for interpretation here. Uh, but, but the starting point wasn't like I exist as a thing through time, but merely I have consciousness, I have experience now. Um, the, there, now, there's, a, there's, a, there's an experience. That's the starting point. Uh, the rest is theory. Well, but what yes. were you going to say, Keith? You, you, what were you about to say, Keith? Come back on this Sorry. about the relation between the reports because it's how that acquaintance gets translated, that acquaintance relation gets translated into reports because you say we can do correlations. The only way we're going to do correlations is between uh, some sort of indication of your state of consciousness, uh, you know, either a mm. report or pressing a button or something like this. You've got to give some indication of your state of consciousness. And then it, and we can match that up with, you know, scans of either what's happening in your brain or something like that. We can try and identify the neural correlates in that way. But what we're doing here is mapping the uh, uh, correlations between the, the scans of your brain and the indications you give of consciousness. And I suppose. Uh, in some now that it, there has to be some sort of mechanism that is interposed between your direct awareness and the the indication you give you know the indication doesn't just follow directly by someone the, the acquaintance yeah. just there's sort of uh, agency co um, correlative of acquaintance where you can directly do something in relation to your directly um, experiencing it there has to be some mechanism so yeah when you find uh, if, we, we, wherever there's a failure, an apparent failure of consciousness, where we don't get the indication when there's a certain brain state, that could always be due to a failure in this mechanism. It could be that that bit of the brain that hasn't lighted up in this case was the bit that was involved in the mechanism of producing the indication, rather than a bit that was involved in consciousness itself. Mm. Okay, so we've seen one situation, the bits A, B, and C light up, and the person indicates consciousness. In another case, bits just A, A and B light up, and the person doesn't indicate consciousness. Now the question is, was C part of the neural correlates of consciousness Good. or part of the neural correlates of the mechanism by which the awareness of consciousness is translated into indication? And there's no, this is kind of, you know, Dan Dennett's point, I guess, about the, you know, with, with his examples with uh, the volume okay. and stamp. There's no way of doing, there's no way of telling. It could That's be that very interesting. 
could be that one neuron is the neural correlates of conscious and everything else is part of the mechanisms of agency. It could be that one really, act is the neural correlate of consciousness, everything else is agency. <laughs> no That's way. really interesting. I, I, th I thought you were going to try and say there's some, I thought you were going to, anyway, I th yeah, so that's really interesting. So look, the, the science of consciousness is really hard if you're the kind of consciousness realist like I am that thinks consciousness is unobservable. I mean, how, you know, how do you, you can't look inside someone's head and see the current? Well, I wouldn't say it's, it's going a bit too far. You know, I mean, this reminds me of an interesting paper by Ned Block, the even harder problem of consciousness, where he worries about things like, you know, how do we know it's the specific physical state you know, that we wouldn't share with a silicon duplicate, or it's some more general computational right. functional state that we would share with you. How on earth do you, these are difficult, but I, you know, I, I, I think these are, these pose theoretical challenges. Uh, you know, sometimes the anti-physicalist argument goes like, oh, well, things would be really hard if your view was true. Uh, and it'd be like, okay, so it's hard. That's life, you know, the, the, the human situation oh, is not ideal. It would be nice if we could, if everything, you know, if we could just focus on what's observable. I think that's why pe people want to just focus on what's observable and quantifiable. And, and, and because that we, we, we've learned how to be precise with that. And, and it's nice. It feels like we've got something that works. Unfortunately, we know this other thing exists that's hard to fit in that. So, so these are challenges. But I think some, I think some theories are going to, just one quick thing, I think some theories are going to be more plausible than others. I, th I think the view that it's just one neuron is going to be a pretty implausible theory. So it's just think, theory building, you know? I think, I, you know, I think, you're, I think you're making a strategic error there. Uh, uh, maybe it's because there's a sense in which I kind of, I have a sort of little bit of um, liking for panpsychism. I'll tell you why. And I think, but I think you're making a strategic error because so, so long as you're trying to integrate it with the science and think that it's test scientific, it isn't. There's no way you can come up with a clever protocol that will filter out, that will d discriminate these different components precisely because one is not detectable observable in any way at all. So, um, uh, you, you can't do that. You can't do so, so don't try. Just say well, it, there is an expert. You know, you, the if you can come up with a protocol, <laughs> I mean, you could say it's implausible that it's one neuron. Well, it's implausible that an atom's conscious. But you know, this is hey. like this is like you know, people, the Churchlands caricature the the the, the you know the anti-materialist argument as you know no one knows how to explain consciousness, therefore it's impossible. I mean, it's like no, no, what no, you're no, saying no, to no, me no, is no, I agree. No, there's a big no, challenge here. But I don't see why it's impossible. I'm getting multiple no, calls from my partner. It's, 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 it's well, not we have been going for over two hours, so we have to eventually. It's not empirically detectable. You, you have to. Uh, that's part of your view. I think that it's not empirically. Now you could sort of come up with some sort of idea of, well, it'd be weird if it was just one. I mean, I'm, I'm, being, I'm not being terribly charitable, but you could say it's more plausible, or you could come up with a priori consideration for saying it ought maybe it should be this, it should be that. But you're not going to be able to do any real science on it, and you shouldn't try. You should say, look, this is a way of this is a way of finding a place for. You see, what your view does, and what panpsychism does quite nicely, is it doesn't muck about with interactionism or anything like this. It says we have these intuitions, and we really want to trust them. So what do we do? Well, let's bury it away right there in the intrinsic nature of matter, where it can do, as it were, no harm, as it were, it's not going to interfere with anything, but it's just going, as it were, sort of infuse everything with a with 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 a, with a the glow of consciousness. And if we want to trust that intuition. That's a nice way of doing it. It doesn't muck about with anything empirical. It doesn't risk any any refutation. And it guarantees that our intuitions can be held on to as long as we want to. But, but that's one option. To, that's one option. When and to, When you try to do science with it, you, you, it seems like, you know, you, you, there's a program here, but there isn't because correlations can never be, you can never establish correlations with the thing itself. Precisely because it's undetectable. I'm just not seeing why this would be a knockdown objection. I mean, you know, if we can take, if we can say, if we can say, um, if we can map commonalities between, you know, certain people have this experience and certain, you know, we, we can come up with more or less plausible uh, yeah, interpretations of what's going. If we can, you know, it, indications. sorry, what, all you can do is map commonalities in the indications they give of consciousness. You can't map correlation. You can't map similarities commonalities, sorry, commonalities, in consciousness itself. You can only map commonalities in the indications of consciousness. Yeah, but I think there will be, 
in terms of what's directly knowable, but I think there will be more or less plausible theories of, of which of which brain processes go. What? Well, then it's just a priori. I mean, just saying it couldn't, it shouldn't. No, it's, it's not a priori. Right. Right. How you do, I mean, if, if you're going to push this hard enough in any scientific theory, you know, there's always an infant. It, sorry, with any empirical data, there's always an infinite number of theories consistent with that data, right. and we, but we, we, we hone them down in terms of theoretical virtues, parsimony, elegance, unity. So, you know, I think some some ways of explaining the data are more plausible that's than just, others. That's all fine, but I think what you should have is that is that in, 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 experimental results will have no. But it's going to be entirely at that level, at that at those levels of pessimism. There's no experimental results have no have no bearing on this because they can't separate out which bit is due to the the actual real consciousness and which bit is due to the 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 the, the bits that translate that awareness into actual into indications of consciousness. And it could be one neuron. It could be one atom. It could be. Uh, it could be a time space point for a while. I know. I don't know. I know. I suppose it couldn't. It's not got an intrinsic nature or anything. But it could be the smallest unit of which there's that there has an intrinsic nature. I'm not dodging. I, I think I'm going to have to go in a second because uh, my my partner's stuck in a car park with um, <laughs> the, the baby's fallen asleep. And, likely uh, story. Likely but, uh, story. But uh, <laughs> well, I will say, I will say, it's it's it's. It's an interesting challenge, but I'm not here. But I, I still think some ways of interpret. Okay, even if you start with correlations between, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Last word on this. Even if you start with correlations between, you know, reports and uh, no. E even if you start whatever correlations you, you can still and say, look, in, in anyone who's had this experience this has been going on in the brain, right? You haven't pinned down what, which is the bit about, con which is the actually un underlying consciousness and which is underlying the response, I agree. But you can still start with those correlations. And I think there's gonna be more or less plausible ways of dividing up. Uh, but it's, it's something I'll have to think between those two elements, what's causing the responses and what, but uh, it's certainly an interesting challenge and uh, I'll have to think about it some more. But go on, Keith. You have the last word. Yeah, I, 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 you know, as you know, I, I, I respect your view. I think it's, an, I think it's, it's a very interesting. Um, it's a very. Uh, so what's the word I want? It's, it's, it's a successful way of, 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 taking that intuition seriously. I think that's kind of the way you have, you have to go in somewhere like that if you take the intuition seriously and the Cartesian intuition seriously and. Uh, my own, if I were to do it myself, I would just say, and it's 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 not nothing to do with science. It's a purely pure part of metaphysics. It's just this, there's this extra ingredient in the universe that is not empirically detectable, and it just kind of lights up everything. And we can't do any science on it. And there it is. That's how the world is at a fundamental level. And what's nice about that is it it, it insulates those intuitions that you want to keep hold of from any kind of possible refutation. I think if you don't do that, then and you do go with doing the science, then you end up the way where science will gradually creep away, creep away, explaining more and more of the functions and reactions, include and, and dispositions, including our dispositions to have judge, make judgments about phenomenal consciousness, including our introspective abilities, including everything, including everything that you've said today will all be explained. And then you'll end up with nothing left. Hold on, maybe, maybe I've misunderstood what, what we're arguing about here. That I mean, yeah, I think si when science identifies the physical processes that give rise to the to the speech, it doesn't mean that it's it's ruled out consciousness. It, I mean, the panpsychist view would be that conscious state underlies those physical processes. Oh, of course, it no, no, I didn't say that. I didn't. I didn't say that it would rule okay. it out, but it would make it less plausible that you need anything more than those mechanisms. Um, that's the thing. What? Well, because if I've explained, why, why? because if I, I, if you've I thought you were making a different argument. No, no, my argument was that you shouldn't engage with the science. You should just treat it as a sort of metaphysical added extra. No, but why? No, but why would that rule out the? The point is, the point is that the the panpsychist thinks this, that when you're studying identifying the physical processes i think the, using the word no, no, mechanism no. is a bit is cheating a bit here no. when you identify the physical processes that gives rise to the response those very physical processes are constituted no, no, no. of forms of consciousness no, 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 so it doesn't no, no, no. rule out 
No, I know, I know, I know what the view is. I didn't mean that it would rule out the possibility of there being uh, the intrinsic natures. I meant it would it would tend to chip away at the intuition that there must be something there. That once you'd explained all your reactions that are associated with consciousness, all the dispositions, in fact, including your judgments about phenomenal consciousness itself, when you you know all the stuff that David Chalmers talks about as as part of the meta problem processes. Once you've explained all that, you explained how convincing this. Uh, what, I mean, pretty much everyone, I think, agrees that we are we are under the illusion of having uh, a phenomenal uh, phenomenal inner world, which can be explained in physical terms. The question is whether the illusion evaluates the illusion is actually there's an actual reality underlying that. You know, we are we have physical mechanisms that create you know, zombies. You know, they are under the illusion of being conscious, right? There are physical mechanisms in us that create that would create the illusion of being conscious. As, conscious, so gee, I'm just moment, that would create the illusion of being conscious, even if we were. <laughs> Right? Every, we would think we were conscious even if we weren't. I think everybody's pretty much agreed on that. The yeah. question is whether those mechanisms are coincidentally or actually tracking the truth about it. And my point is that once you start doing the science and explicating those mechanisms, you may lose your intuition that there is a reality underlying them, a phenomenal reality underlying them. That's my thought. That's why playing with this, that's why going with the science is risky. Uh, yeah. It's an interesting. I mean, it's almost like the Descartes, Descartes' argument against animal consciousness. Uh, he, he argued that if you exactly. raise someone in a basement and they built these me mechanisms and they built something that acted exactly like a dog, then they would just realize that oh yeah, there's nothing special about dogs. They're just basically mechanisms, and and their pre theoretical grip on they being they're being conscious would just go away because all the stuff would be understood. It's sort of yeah, like if you. If you're a dualist, that's right. If you think consciousness is somehow extra to the physical processes, and then you identify all these physical processes that explain behavior, yeah, you're going to think, oh, consciousness doesn't exist. But, but the panpsychist doesn't think that they th they they're studying these things, physical processes, and and they take no, them to be forms of consciousness. So so you no, identify the, the physical, hmm? the intrinsic, the intrinsic natures of those processes. They're not. Not yeah, but that's not, I mean, when you say intrinsic nature, people tend to build too much. Into it. It's not like it's this yeah. extra thing or this extra property. Mm. It's just, that is what the physical state is. Physical science describes how it behaves, but that's, but that is what it is. Realizing property, isn't it? I mean, it's the sort of, it's the, isn't the idea that it's the, it's the intrinsic nature of the fundamental uh, constituents that it's physics describes in causal and dynamical terms, in functional terms? And which could have been something other than consciousness, presumably. It could have been that intrinsic. I don't think the thing itself could have been something different. To con I don't think the physical the physical state is what it is, and it can't be another thing. Uh, not uh, I mean, it could have been, it could have been a world in which the the, the the fundamental realizing property was something other than consciousness. I mean, in our world, it isn't. If you're right, but in, there could have been a yeah. world where it was something else. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Whatever. It would be a different yeah. physical state, but it would still have all the same functional properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we couldn't, we couldn't yeah. tell whether it was uh, by doing experiments whether it was. If we if we were transported to another universe, we couldn't do any experiments to tell whether consciousness was the fundamental realizing thing there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Consciousness is unobservable. Uh, <sighs> yeah, uh, guys, it's it's been over two hours, and I know Philip's got, got a, I don't know what a car park is, but it sounds like there's a baby in it, and, and it's, uh, that's not good. So, uh, it's not with dangerous. regret, I'm going to... not dangerous, but... Okay. <laughs> with regret, I'm going to have to say, maybe we'll have to do another one of these, and but, but end this discussion today. Um, it's been a very a great discussion, both of you. Thank you so much. It's for really your, good fun, actually. I've, I've really been thinking about... Um, thinking I'm about... What's hardwired and what's the, the what's theoretical has been really interesting. Okay. Anyway, sorry, Keith. I think we haven't we haven't really given uh, Richard enough time to, to talk and tell us about his views, and I think we uh, so apologies for that. But uh, oh, I, yeah, well, yeah, I'll harass you guys later, and we'll do this again possibly. But mostly, I just want to thank you for being such charitable in the locker with you guys. Uh, people who disagree, still friendly, still serious. Trying not to talk past each other. I think this is really the best. Oh, yes, and go and read Philip's new book. Um, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's a very elegant and, and well written and lovely presentation of the view. And yeah. uh, some Aww. people think it's <laughs> read it at least. That's very kind of you to say so. <laughs> Out November 5th in the US, November, November 7th 5th. in the UK. 
Yep, absolutely looking forward to it. All right, All right thanks, that. guys. I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast now. Okay. Bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks Bye. for organizing. Good fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. I think we're going to be clear here.